faccio un'introduzione adesso, magari lo streaming lo fai partire quando cominciamo con i talk, no? Ok, fa andare. beginning in time. Um, we are hosted in this uh, wonderful hall. It's a very big uh, hall for us. We're about 50, 55 people. Um, we looked for a smaller one. Uh, it is, was impossible to have it for the three days uh, because there are students, there are teachings, lessons, conferences around. So the only one available for the whole three days is this one. So, uh, welcome in uh, the main hall of the University of Pavia. Uh, for the tutorials, it will be rearranged a bit. So, the chairs in the front will be removed and we will have tables and we will uh, set up a sort of uh, laboratory inside uh, the room. A yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, couple of very um, simple instructions. Uh, first of all, the power lines. Uh, we are waiting for the longer cables that will give power lines to the uh, room. Yeah. I'm not sure if anybody... Around 10 o'clock we will have it. Okay. Simona is taking care of these aspects of logistics, so uh, in uh, one hour we should have longer power lines and uh, electricity for everybody. Um, the Wi-Fi's, uh, are all of you connected, happy, any problems? If you have problems, I have a password for Eduron. You are this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, I can give you the password. Because so, you can go on Edurom. Edurom normally works fine, but if you need a specific password with another Wi-Fi, another uh, router, we have it. Okay. So anybody who needs it, just tell. Yeah, just tell me. If it didn't, I'm um, Any other issues? You want to tell something? Or? No. Uh, Coffee break is upstairs. Yeah, the coffee break is upstairs, so we will move out of the room and they will move out in another yeah. place for the coffee break. <laughs> and if you need the toilet, you have to get out and take a small door that is in front of us. Okay. okay. That's very, very basic. <laughs> very basic. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I have to thank for the organization uh, Simone and Claudia, who did quite a lot. Uh, and uh, uh, all the uh, guys in the laboratory who also helped, helped uh, in uh, many of the steps of this organization. So the idea is uh, written in the program, and you have seen it. Uh, the idea is to give a, um, a, a set of information about uh, the models that are uh, built on the cerebellum and the tutorials on how to build this model and how to use these models on the platforms of the Human Brain uh, Project. Um, what is the idea that stays behind that? That the cerebellum is quite advanced in terms of modeling and is providing a sort of uh, benchmark on the one hand and also uh, inspiration for developing the models and the basis for going forward. You know that Human Brain Project is a sort of uh, um, iterative uh, system in which every two, three years we have to renew the programs, the platforms. We are going toward SJ3, what we call SJ3. We'll start in uh, three months since now. And we have to be ready to jump into this new phase of the project in which the platforms will be modified, will be renewed. Many of you are working in the platforms, you know it very well. Uh, and therefore, we also needed to take into account this transformation of the current system into the new system. We have to be ready. So what we will make here is also the point. We'll make the point. So where we are and where we are going. So why the cerebellum? What are the models of the cerebellum? Why they are interesting in terms of modeling for the cerebellum, but not only for the brain? And many of you are not working on the cerebellum, are working in other areas. This is a very important point. 
So making the models in the cerebellum doesn't mean that we have to stay with our ideas into the cerebellum, inside it. We have to move out of it to reconnect with the models that you are doing. So your experience in other fields, in other subnetworks, is extremely important. Uh, and then the tutorials, in order to see how the problems have been solved and implemented and are running on the systems of the HPP. So this is what this uh, hackathon is uh, going to be. And it will be, thanks to all of you, to all your communications, participation, and uh, demonstrations uh, hands on. Um, we start. If yes. Claudia wanted, you want to tell something more, or you can start with your presentation. I start we'll with my it. presentation. Okay. And for any uh, issues, any problems, just ask, and we're here. Good. So we come directly to the point, and uh, what I want to give you in this uh, first talk is an overview on the cerebellum modeling. Cerebellum modeling from single neurons to closed-loop controllers and virtual brains. Um, you know that one of the main issues in modeling the brain is the multiscale issue. We have models at the level of cells, at the level of microcircuits, of large-scale networks and whole brains that can be transformed and used in many ways. And therefore, there are many models, not one model. And this is an issue that can be exemplified through the case of the cerebellum. <coughs> um, the first point is, therefore, the reason for creating brain models. Then I will consider the strategies for creating brain models. And then the cerebellum experiments, observation, and theories. There are not only models. There are experiments at the base of the models. We are studying something that is related to nature. We have to make experiments. So there will be a, a big deal in considering the experiments. And then theories. Without theories, the models are almost useless. So we need theories to interpret the data and to build the model. So there is an interplay, continuous interplay, between theories, models, observations, and experiments. Uh, then modeling the cerebellum, this uh, will be um, uh, the core of the issue here. There will be um, talks and explanations on cellular models, microcircuit models. Then the cerebellum models in robotic controllers. For some reasons, many of you are engineers or know the story. Um, the cerebellum is very interesting in terms of system theory. It's the heart of system theory for control theory. So the cerebellum is very good to be used into system controllers and then goes into the robots. Um, and then the cerebellum models in virtual brain. That's one of the frontiers uh, because it will be a frontier in SJ3. Uh, and the reason is that the brain is not made of the cortex only, as in many cases it is assumed to be, but it is made of many structures. The cortex is just one. In evolutionary terms, is the last to come. And the cerebellum and the basal ganglia and the hippocampus are very important. So one of the frontiers in SJ3 will be to expand the virtual brains from a cortical virtual brain, as it is now, to a virtual brain, as it will be. So one of the frontiers is to introduce and the models of these other sections of the brain into the virtual brains. And this will be the last part of our models. Um, then uh, start with from the beginning. So why do we need models of the brain? Um, I'm trying to wrap up the ideas and try to give uh, hints for discussion also. So we want to understand the when, what, and how of brain functioning. So when are specific brain circuits activated? Large areas of neuroscience are dealing with, with, with it. That go to an MRI scanner laboratory. People does the job. So they 
try to understand what are the areas that are activated during a specific task, cognitive task, emotional task, or whatever other kind of task, then they try to understand when these areas are activated, trying to reconstruct a sort of architecture of brain activity. The other question is what do the brain circuit compute? That's a completely different question. So what do they do? Because clearly the brain is carrying out the job of calculating, of producing an outcome given the input. So how does it do it? And what is it computing? So what is the transfer function of the brain or of the circuit or of the neuron? Even deeper questions are about how the brain circuits work. How do they operate? Because these brain circuits have a mechanism of function that is based on neurons. And the neurons have their logics, have their nature. They work in some way that are based on the ionic channels, the membrane uh, uh, properties of the neuron. And this is the hardware. So how do we reconnect the hardware with the function and uh, eventually the big operation of using the brain areas for producing cognition, emotion, and all the rest. So basically, ultimately, how does the brain generate behavior, cognition, and for those who are interested, makes us conscious. So these are the big issues. This is the background. This is what we, were, uh, we want to understand, where we want to go. The main problem in uh, tackling the issue is uh, the multiscale organization of the brain. The multiscale organization of the brain means that whatever we do is distributed over different levels, which means we can spend a life in uh, studying an ionic channel or a life in studying MRI images. But then we never get the whole picture because to get the whole picture, we have to reconnect the levels. The most important levels in terms of modeling, as far as we understand, as far as we can manage to war with them are the cellular level, cellular subcellular level, they stay together. Then we have the microcircuit level. Then uh, we have a level that is called the mesoscale, that is made of a microcircuit extended to its surrounding. It's a sort of self standing system that is very important in terms of computation, not well explored. And then we have the high scale level or large scale level, in which we have all the elements of the brain connected together. This is the brain. So these are the levels at which the models can be developed. Starting from the neurons, this is what the neurons do. Basically, the neurons make action potentials and elaborate membrane potentials in a way that produces the code of the neuron. The neurons are microcalculators. We can call them the CPUs of the brain. And these many neurons generate codes that are transmitted to other neurons. That's the world of the neurons. This is an example. All the examples that I will be uh, showing you are taken from the cerebellum. So I'm already targeting my talk toward the cerebellum. This is an example of the granule cell that makes spikes in a, some, in a certain manner. You will have time to see it during the three days. So I don't stay on the details now. The other one is the Golgi cell, the Golgi cell that makes spikes in another manner. So this is an example of two neurons that are one next to the other. They're connected one to each other. And these neurons are generating codes. These codes are different. They encode information in a different way. And they do different things. So this is the hardware of the brain. So we, sooner or later, we'll have to connect it to this hardware if you want to understand how the brain works. Um, this is an example of moving up of scale. And uh, the neurons stayed here on the bottom left of the picture. And what happens when we want to understand a bit more about the many neurons that make a circuit? At this level, we cannot use the normal, ordinary uh, electrophysiological techniques like the pitch clamp recording techniques. We needed to use more elaborated techniques, for example, multi-photon, uh, multi-spot uh, laser uh, controlled scanning techniques, which allow to pick up the signal from many neurons simultaneously. We lose specificity, we lose precision on the single neuron, but then we see many neurons. <laughs> 
With these techniques, we can begin to approach the experimental uh, investigation of the networks. We're doing it. Some laboratories are doing it. And in this way, we begin to have information on this. If we want to move up a bit more, we go into the mesoscale, uh, then we can have recordings even less precise, even more global, but very informative on the mesoscale. For example, the local field potentials. The local field potentials tell us what an ensemble of neurons is doing, but not what the single neurons are doing. If we want to move even more up, we go to the uh, areas, active areas of the brain, and we use electroencephalography or uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And at this level, we see areas that are activated during certain tasks, so we can really approach behavior. And at that point, we lose completely the connection with neurons. We do not see anything related to neurons directly. The neurons generate the signal, but the neurons are very far from the signal. So we need strategies. And in our case, we will point our attention on the models. We need strategies, modeling strategies, to reconnect all the levels. Um, Last but not least, is very important, the architecture of brain computation. Sometimes we forget it when we study a neuron, when we study a microcircuit, but the system is conceived and is engineered as a complex adaptive system. Complex because it has several interactions between the elements. Adaptive because it changes with uh, use is embedded with mechanisms allowing to learn, to store memory. And adaptation and memory are used in a way to generate a system that can predict, can predict the consequences of its computation. Generates an internal virtual world that is used to predict the consequences of the actions of the organism. That's the way the brain works. Never forget it. When we have to do something uh, related to brains, we need always to consider that the brain is something like this, and what we are studying are the mechanisms that allow the brain to do the job. This will happen to be important when we consider the controllers. For example, robotic controllers are close to this architecture. And if we do it in the proper manner, we are really close to understanding how the architecture of the brain operates. So, uh, given all of this, and given uh, many other considerations at the microscopic, mesoscopic, macroscopic level, what it turns out is that there are many reasons to create brain models. First of all, we have to bridge scales, as I told you. Secondly, we need to generate a general theory to be tested and falsified. Science normally proceeds through theories or hypotheses that become theories that can be tested or accepted or falsified. That's the way that normally science proceeds since ever. That's the way we proceed with our reasoning since ever. So why not to do it with the brain? But for some reason, the brain is so uh, difficult to study that in the years, this approach has never been taken seriously. There are some theories, some ideas, or some hypotheses. They're accepted, they're discarded, then there is a discovery maybe serendipic, and then something, everything changes. So we need something more solid, more grounded. And the models give the opportunity of finding, testing, and elaborating hypotheses and theories on the brain in a sort of systematic manner. Another important point is to fill gaps in knowledge through constructive rules. For everybody of us who are dealing with experimental brain investigation, it is very clear that there are so many details and so many things to understand and so many unknowns in the system that we get lost. So it's important to have a framework into which we can put the elements, we can put the pieces. So we know where our piece have to go and we know the relative importance of our piece. Um, Last but not least, the models foster future ICT and medicine. So basically, they are the basis to promote the development of technology. <laughs>
to be applied in the computational sciences and in medicine. So there is a clear idea of what the fallout could be. Um, useless to say where most of us are part of the Human Brain Project, and not all, but most of us, the Human Brain Project has taken uh, uh, the challenge a couple of years ago and is actually doing the job, trying to do the job. So that's the reason why we're here, because there is this big initiative that is promoting the development of models. Now, how to create these models? After seven years of uh, struggles, uh, there have been fights, struggles, fights, wars inside HBP. Everything happened. But that was real science. I've been I've seeing it a posteriori now. Uh, what might have been a sort of, uh, let's say, contrast between personalities is actually, was actually real scientific discussion. So how to do brain models was not very clear at the beginning. At the beginning, the idea was to make a model bottom-up, pure bottom-up. So we start from bottom, we climb up, we make the brain. For some reason, the idea is not wrong, but it's, uh, I would say, impractical. It doesn't work. Because uh, at some point, the complexity explodes. And we can go up to some level in this way that we must do it. Otherwise, we don't connect to the neurons. But then all the information coming and all the observations coming from the brain have to be used, have to be integrated. So the idea now is to use a two-pronged approach. On the one side, we have this area that is uh, yellow, uh, the reverse engineering area that allows to make neurons, to make microcircuits, and to go up to microcircuit models that can be detailed, can be simplified, we can do them in different ways. We'll see them. We're actually enforcing this strategy now. And this is where we can go with bottom-up approaches. We start from the molecules, we make the neurons, the neurons are connected together in networks, and the networks begin to work. The most that we can do is to connect some networks together. That is something that will happen in SG3 leading to large-scale models constructed bottom-up, basically. Um, the other branch is to start from the observations on the brain architecture that mostly come from magnetic resonance imaging at the moment, and from anatomy and from uh, system physiology, and then go down using the connectome, using brain atlases, uh, creating virtual brain models. And then these virtual brain models uh, Eventually, we need it to be integrated with the bottom-up branch. This integration can happen in many ways. We will have time to discuss the last day on the many ways it might happen. Uh, but there are already works going on to enforce, to implement this integration. So finally, the two words, the so-called top-down and bottom-up words, will merge and join together, generating the brain models. The cerebellum is uh, contributing uh, quite intensely to this strategy on both sides. So this is again an example that we will use to understand the core of the issue and the general strategy that we needed to generate brain models. All the story starts from here. Um, uh, we start from the theories of uh, neuronal function from cellular biophysics. And starting from here, we have to take into account all the properties of the membrane, of the ionic channels, of the different parts of the neurons, the dendrites, the axons, the soma, and then also the synapses to connect the neurons together. So we have an homogeneous representation of this world of cellular and molecular events that allows us to make neurons. Again, I don't stay on this, I will just I just mentioned it, it will be presented more completely in the next days. But this is the starting point. Um, what comes out is that experimental physiology shows the main operation carried out by the neurons, the cerebellar neurons, the synapses, and the microcircuits, and suggests how they are generated at the cellular level. So the local importance, the local meaning, of this kind of models is to explain cellular physiology. 
The first who did it were Hodgkin and Axley. They won the Nobel Prize a couple of decades ago. So basically, they already understood that that was the way to explain the physics of the neuron, and we're still doing it. So these models are biophysical representation of the neurons. Their first meaning is to explain the neuron and to explain the physics of the neuron. Then these models can be, as I told you, used to expand and project properties toward higher levels. Um, just to make an example, Hope the movies work. This is an example taken from uh, a model that uh, was done by uh, Stefano uh, two years ago. This is a model of the Purkinje cell, and the Purkinje cell is probably the most complex model of the brain, and the most complex neuron of the brain. It's the biggest it receives more than 100,000 synapses. So at least it's the biggest in terms of the synaptic input. And the architecture of the neuron is so special that makes it a sort of perceptron with an dendritic tree that works as a real perceptron, non-linear, because it has non-linear mechanisms inside, that con uh, conveys information to the uh, um, Axon, axonal spike generation site. So basically there is a perception that then is connected to the encoder. And this comes out from the architecture of the neuron and the dislocation of the ionic channels and the type of the ionic channels. The model that we have done is a model that makes the point in a way because it captures all the known physiological properties of the neuron that are many, many, many tens of properties that have been discovered and described in many scientific papers. So basically, this is the kind of model that we can expect out of the cellular level. And this kind of models now we have for the Purkinje cell, for the granule cell, the Golgi cell, the Stelit cell. Basically, we have models for all the neurons of the cerebellum. We'll come to it. Um, now, I try to explain a bit better what the cerebellum is and what the cerebellum is doing. Uh, probably for those who are working on the cerebellum is a known story, and for the others is a new story. And uh, I will try to stay in the middle. Uh, of course, if you have questions, ask now or at the end of my presentation. And then we have three days to discuss on all of this. Okay. Um, the cerebellum shows the typical multiscale brain organization. Again, molecules, neurons, microcircuit connections, uh, microscale, mesoscale, whatever. So what I said before is valid for the cerebellum. The cerebellum is organized in modules. This is very important. When we speak about the model of the cerebellum, we speak about the model of a module of the cerebellum which means a functional unit that is made of several tens of thousands of neurons. It's a bit like the cerebral cortex in which we identify the microcolumn. Now, when we say we have a model of the cerebral cortex, normally we speak about the model of a microcolumn or a model of the hippocampus. We take a functional unit of the hippocampus, maybe not the whole hippocampus. So basically, what is important here is that we model a module and then using the connection rules, we reconstruct the whole cerebellum connecting its modules. Okay. What is important to do now is to understand the computational algorithm of the module. So we have the clear idea that this module is fundamentally a mathematical operation. It makes a mathematical transformation of the input and generates the output. How this mathematical operation is used is used to modify signals that are coming from the cerebral cortex and from the peripheral systems. These signals are transformed and sent back to the cerebral cortex and the peripheral systems. So it's an operation that stays in the middle of a loop. It's not an operation valid for itself. It's not very useful on itself. It's useful because it is a part of a system. Yeah. <laughs>
the modules are connected to different brain areas, and this operation can sort out very different outcome, outcomes. For example, if it is connected to motor systems, it can control movement. If it is connected to cognitive system, it can control cognition and so forth. So it is a general purpose operation at the core of loops that are used for different kinds of behavioral uh, uh, aspects of our, several aspects of our behavior. Um, what are the main uh, operations carried out inside the circuit? First of all, uh, well, these operations have been identified uh, experimentally and hypothesized, and then we have the possibility through the models to test them and to verify what they are actually and how they are generated by the neurons. First of all, there is a spatial temporal recoding. Spatial temporal recoding is one of the fundamental operations of the cerebellum. The cerebellum takes information from every part of the body and every part of the brain is connected to every part of the body and the brain. And what the cerebellum does is to transform in space and time the signals that are coming. This uh, spatial temporal recoding, uh, sorry, some <laughs> uh, it's better that I switch off Skype. Well, I will do it. And uh, that's why somebody was laughing. <laughs> I didn't notice that. Um, the spatial temporal recoding happens mostly in the granular layer, which is the input part of the cerebellar cortex, where the signals are transformed in space and time. We're beginning to understand the basis of this spatial temporal transformation uh, using the models. Um, the two main operations that are inside the spatial temporal recoding are adaptive filtering, that means changes in gain changes in phase and changes in bandwidth of the signals, <clears throat> and also center surround uh, that is a spatial filter. Center surround is spatial filtering, so we have temporal and spatial filtering. Then binding and tuning, the cerebellum is bi uh, operates binding and tuning with the rest of the brain, so gets in a connection on specific um, uh, on specific oscillation frequencies. And this requires internal oscillations and also requires resonance. That's another property that can be analyzed very nicely with the models. Pattern recognitions, we need perceptrons, and the perceptrons actually are mostly located in the Purkinje neuron. So the Purkinje cell, since the beginning, was thought to operate as a perceptron that takes the information that has been spatially and temporally recoded in the previous stages of the network. And then the learning and memory. Plasticity is fundamental. The cerebellum is the heart of learning for what we call um, procedural learning. And the cerebellum has many sites of learning in the granular layer, molecular layer, deep cerebellar nuclei. Before going forth, uh, I would like to give an anatomical uh, indication. The cerebellum is made of the cerebellar cortex and the deep cerebellar nuclei. These are two different things. They make up the cerebellum. The cerebellar cortex, in turn, is made of the granular layer, the Purkinje cell layer, and the molecular layer. So cerebellar cortex, granular layer, Purkinje cell layer, and molecular layer, one part. Deep cerebellar nuclei, another part. If you put them together, you make the cerebellum. There is another nucleus that is fundamental for the cerebellum. It is called the inferior olive. And the inferior olive plus the cerebellum builds up the olivocerebellar complex. This is the mesoscale. So you can consider the cerebellum as a microcircuit on the microscale. The cerebellum plus deep cerebellar nuclei and inferior olive is a, a mesoscale complex. OK. It's a bit like considering uh, the cerebral cortex plus the thalamus. This is mesoscale. Or the basal ganglia with the thalamus and the cerebral cortex. That's, again, mesoscale. So basically, when we put these things together, we generate a complex that is functionally meaningful. 
Okay, so this is what we're dealing with. Um, the cerebellum is famous because it is involved in the control of movement. And uh, uh, clinically, the dysfunction of the cerebellum emerges as a disorder of movement called ataxia. Uh, typically, the movement of an arm that uh, uh, moves from an end point to a target point becomes very regular. The movement uh, oscillates. There are delays in the start of the movement, and there are delays in the end of the movement. This is typical of the ataxic movement. Um, there are other symptoms that derive from uh, uh, cerebellar dysfunction, and since the early times, there was some indication that the cerebellum was also involved in cognition. Um, but this was not worked out clearly until recently. And I give you some examples. Um, first of all, the cerebellum is uh, strongly connected to the cerebral cortex, and not only to motor areas but also, and I would say predominantly, to non-motor areas, which is a bit at odd with the idea that the cerebellum is a pure motor center. It's not a pure motor center. It's connected by more, no more than 10, 15% to motor areas. About 80, 85% of connections go to associative areas, which means non-motor. So it must be involved in other things, for example, cognition and emotion. And the proofs that this happened, actually, has been uh, provided in the last years and are continuously being provided. Uh, this is, an, the, I will come back to this later. For example, uh, in this experiment, uh, the cerebellum is uh, uh, involved uh, in uh, the execution of an action or in the observation of an action executed by others. Um, what do you think? The, the cerebellum is more involved in the execution or in the observation of the actions of the others? It is true the second case is more involved in the observation of the action of the others. And the reason that we believe uh, at the basis of this is that the cerebellum is simulating the action of the others, is at the core of the predictive machine of the brain. So when we observe another carrying out an action, we simulate internally the action of the other. And eventually, we may be able to learn from the action of the other, and then we may be able to replicate and imitate. It, the process passes through a simulation, an internal simulation, and this internal simulation involves, strongly involves the cerebellum. So this is something that was uh, done two years ago, and is a nice indication. There are many, it's not the only one. I showed just one that was taken in our laboratories, but it's just one. Um, in another case, this, uh, the cerebellum uh, is involved in resting state networks. Um, probably, you all know that the uh, brain is coordinated in a much more complex manner than we normally think. And uh, it has internal activity that goes on continuously. And there are areas that are temporally and spatially correlated. These temporally and spatially correlated areas uh, make up the so-called resting state networks discovered about 20 years ago and now very famous and very important for MRI analysis. These networks connect areas that are apparently distant and disconnected, but they are not. They make up functional clusters. And these functional clusters tell us uh, uh, quite a lot about the architecture of the brain. The cerebellum is involved in four, in, well, in four, in eight of these areas, but four of them are particularly important. One of these areas is the so-called uh, DMN. This is the default mode network. The default mode network is the area that is activated in default, in the default brain state, which means when we are thinking about nothing, we're self-reflecting, we're in a way meditating. And this area is the area, is, is the network, this network is the network that uh, works in the background. Um, the play between our internal self and the external world is to switch from the DMN to other areas connected to the external world. For example, the salience network is this one. 
The silence network is the network that takes part to uh, the understanding and extraction of silent features from the external world. What happens when we switch from one to the other? We need an attentional network. So we switch attention from our interior to the exterior. So we need attentional networks that operate the switch. And there are attentional networks. The cerebellum is fundamental in the DMN, in the silence network, and in the attentional network. So clearly the cerebellum is not only controlling motion. The cerebellum is critically involved in the operation of regulating the switch from the internal state to the external state. That's another hint that the cerebellum is not only motion. In the robots, we will see applications to the robots, very nice. Um, the cerebellum is clearly taking part to motor uh, control systems, but it's not the only thing that it's doing. This is just one part of what the cerebellum is doing. Um, last but not least, the cerebellum is taking part to emotional control. To uh, our surprise, two years ago, well, last year, uh, we found in, uh, that the cerebellum is involved in emotion because it controls the ventral tegmental area. Controlling the ventral tegmental area means controlling dopamine release, and controlling dopamine release means controlling the brain state that regulates the interplay between uh, reward and motivation. Um, you may say, but why the cerebellum is doing all these things if it has a single core algorithm? The point is that the cerebellum in the system theory is thought to play this role of checking the errors, revealing the errors, and correcting the errors. So wherever there is an error, error means discrepancy, something that is not predicted. If there is something that is not predicted, for the brain is an error. And if there is an error, it must, something must be done. Either we switch attention, so this not predicted stuff is interesting, we switch attention, or we correct the error, so the movement is wrong, we correct the movement. Um, or we have to enforce any other kind of motivational reward task to explore this new unexpected happening. So basically, the concept of prediction and uh, error control is much more extended than motor control. And this is becoming, beginning to become more and more clear in the years. There have been pioneering studies and pioneering ideas in the beginning of, the, uh, of this uh, uh, millennium, in the 2000, 2001, 2002, but then the data began to come. And now we have data. They're beginning to tell us that this is probably the good, the good uh, way to go. To, uh, so that there will be more experiments on this. So this is the background. This is where the cerebellum has to be located in the brain much more than pure motor control. Um, this is about the what. What the cerebellum is doing. What the cerebellum is doing with the system theory that was developed in the 80s. Uh, the cerebellum is taking part to feedback and feed forward loops and plays the role of a feedback and feed forward controller or inverse and forward controller. Um, the cerebellum in this way can regulate the activity of the cerebral cortex and directly the activity of the motor centers in the spinal cord and in the brainstem. So the cerebellum, I don't stay again on these aspects in case they can be developed in the section on the systems into which the cerebellum will be embedded in the uh, robotic controllers. But this is what the cerebellum is doing. The first uh, way uh, to integrate the what, how, and when of the cerebellum uh, was proposed in the, the motor learning theory by Mar, Albus, and Ito in uh, between the 70s and the 80s. And uh, this is the first way to integrate all these aspects uh, with different blendings, but uh, the idea was that basically the cerebellum performs basic operations based on neuronal functions that were mostly unknown at that time, 
They were just hypothesized. And then becomes able to perform this spatial temporal uh, recording uh, with this perception operation and eventually to control motor errors. That was the beginning of the story. In doing so, the cerebellum needs to learn, and it was predicted that, that learning happens between the parallel fibers and the Purkinje cells. That was a main prediction in uh, the 80s, beginning of the 80s, uh, Masao Ito discovered this plasticity. That was really the beginning of the new era. It was the second main form of plasticity discovered at all. The first one was in the hippocampus. It was an LTP, and this one was an LTD. You can imagine the, uh, the enthusiasm and, the, and the, uh, um, the explosion of experimental activity at that time. Uh, what we know now is that there is not just one form of plasticity in the cerebellum, there are about 15 forms of plasticity, uh, probably more. The more we look for them, the more we discover. Uh, the other point is that the properties of neurons, this perceptron, was hypothesized. Nobody knew whether it was true. Now there are many ideas about the activity of this perceptron, the Purkinje neuron, and about the activity of the individual neurons of the cerebellum. Uh, just to be um, very simple, the initially it was thought that the neurons were linear converters. They took the information, they applied the gain transformation, and then they sent out the information again. They are nonlinear. No one of them is linear. They are strongly nonlinear. And therefore, the nonlinearity imposes changes into the way the microcircuit works. The reasons why this nonlinearity is so important is not completely clear yet. But what we can clearly say is that changing, touching a tiny property in an ionic channel, which means touching a bit of the nonlinearity, means destroying the brain, generating a pathology. So clearly there must be a role, a fundamental role for these nonlinearities, but you still do not know what it, what it is. And this is a very important issue. So now we have a theory, an old theory, that has to be made new because we have mo many more information. And therefore, the models have to play a critical role here. Um, modeling the cerebellum, how do we proceed? Again, we have models at the cellular level. These are transformed into models at uh, the uh, network level, the microcircuit level. These models are simplified and embedded into controllers that can be used to, to drive robo robots. When we have the robots, we do not have just an artifact that it is useful to play with. We have something very important to understand how the properties of the neurons take part to controlling a system that is interacting with the environment. And we have the feedback from the sensors that goes back and fuels memory, learning and memory. So we have the integrated system. That's the only way to understand how and why the cellular properties are important in the ensemble. Uh, the final target is to go into virtual brain uh, simulators, and this is something that will be uh, uh, explained in the end of this uh, uh, meeting. And the reason why this having these virtual brain simulators is important is uh, rather obvious, because they can be used to understand the brain computation, brain signal generation, and they can be applied to pathology. Um, cellular models, we have all the models of the cerebellum now. Some of them are published. Some of them are published, but we have new versions. Some of them were not in the list of those to be developed first, and, but we have a preliminary versions. And all of these models will be finalized and uh, uh, released, uh, hopefully, soon. You will see some of them during the tutorials. The main neurons of the cerebellum are uh, the Purkinje cell, the granule cell, the Golgi cell, the stellate cell, the basket cells. So five neurons are the main neurons making up the cerebral cortex. There are other neurons. For example, the unipolar brass cells. We have the model. We did it a couple of years ago. 
but it has never been included into the networks of the cerebellum for some reasons. So for the moment, we need five neurons and we have them. Um, the other point is the deep cerebellar nuclei. These are a sort of black hole in a way because uh, we do not know very much about them. Um, the deep cerebellar nuclei are made up of at least five or six types of neurons. And normally, when dealing with the deep cerebellar nuclei, we have only one type of neuron and only one model of these neurons. Um, it would merit expansion in the future. At the moment, we can use a very simplified version of the deep cerebellar nuclei with one kind of excitatory and one kind of inhibitory neuron, so only two out of five or six. And also, the physiology and the anatomy of these neurons and these nuclei is not completely understood. So we have to make simplifying assumptions on the deep cerebellar nuclei. Same story for the inferior olive. The inferior olive is not completely understood, and, but we have models of the inferior olive. And we hope uh, we will be able to develop these models better in the future, also through collaborations. So we can't do everything ourselves, it's too much. So through collaboration, we should be able to get to the level of having a precise representation, not only of the cerebellar cortex that we are going to get, but also of the other parts of the cerebellum. Um, Microcircuit models. The microcircuit model will be explained uh, at length during this hackathon. Uh, one point with these models is that they are made of many different kinds of neurons. They can be uh, made up of simplified neuronal representations or of full-blown neuronal representations using two different kinds of simulators, PyNest, Python Nest, or Python Neuron. And we have in our programs to develop also the versions of these simulators for Arbor, again, through collaboration. So basically, we have a technological basis, an informatic basis, that allows to work with different kinds of simulators that are useful for different kinds of applications. For example, large-scale networks at the moment requires finest and simplify the neurons. Smaller network with high level of details can run nicely with Python neuron at the moment. So basically, this is the level at which we are. Um, constructing uh, these uh, models requires a strategy because um, both for the single neurons that is well casted now, and also for the microcircuit, it, it is a bit more new, it is under development. So what we propose is a scaffold strategy in which we have a sequence of actions that can be identified during the process of circuit building in which we have the placement of the cells, the connectivity of the cells, then the insertion of the specific models that we've done as a cellular models, and then platforms for the simulation of these models. It will be interesting to compare the strategies that we are developing with those that have been developed for the basal ganglia and the hippocampus. Because in the future, if we have to connect all these microcircuits together, it would be nice to have a convergence, at least of the fundamental operations that these uh, microcircuit scaffolding uh, processes are using. Um, these are examples that will be explained at length by uh, Cloud and all the others during the next talks. These are examples of uh, the uh, reconstruction of these uh, uh, microcircuits uh, with some graphic uh, representations. That's another very important issue. Without uh, visual graphics, it is very difficult to understand what we're doing. Uh, and then uh, this is an example of uh, the network that uh, is running and is uh, predicting properties like uh, uh, spatial temporal filtering. So the network is already able to predict the main properties that were anticipated by theory. For example, it is able to predict how the center surrounds filter the signals, how the center surround the process uh, LTP and the LTD, so process plasticity, 
how plasticity modifies the centers around because the plasticity basically is not there to learn something, it's there to modify the computational modules of the cerebellum. And therefore, these elements are becoming clear. To demonstrate all of them, we need work, but the elements are all there. Um, now, I go to the last part of this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, the networks can be simplified and introduced into robotic controllers. We call them robotic controllers, but it would be easier to tell uh, closed-the-loop controllers that can be used for a robot or not. And the robot can itself be a real robot or a simulated robot. So, I mean, I don't want to be confusing on this uh, terminology. Uh, but clearly, once we have the closed-loop controller, we have the tools to work into, to apply it to virtual and real robots. So what we're most interested in at this moment is the controller, okay, the closed-loop controller. This closed-loop controller, again, is revealing that the server bandwidth is a general purpose machine because it can be used to simulate many different uh, uh, behaviors. We have started with the most typical uh, and tractable cerebellar behaviors, and uh, um, we have done the, the vestibulo-ocular reflex, uh, the eye blink classical conditioning, the force field uh, uh, control, the arm uh, uh, object manipulation, and so forth. So basically, all these uh, uh, aspects of behavior can be nicely controlled by the cerebellar uh, closed-loop controllers. Um, in these controllers, the cerebellum is uh, represented as a spiking network. The other parts of the brain are not yet represented as spiking networks. That's a frontier for the future. At the moment, only the cerebellum in these controllers is spiking. The rest is non-spiking. And therefore, we need interfaces that transform the spikes of the cerebellum into analogs, and the analogs of the cortex or whatever else into spikes for the cerebellum. So basically we need uh, analog and uh, digital transformations. Um, this is an example of the cerebellum performing a, um, this is performing a task avoidance, an, an obstacle avoidance task. Uh, and uh, the neurons can be tracked, so we know what the neurons are doing, and uh, we can understand what actually the neurons do into the network. This is an example of the Purkinje cell and the deep cerebellar nuclei. During learning, you see that the, the Purkinje cell uh, learns to switch off. This is due to LTD, happening at the parallel fiber Purkinje cell synapse. And this switch off of the Purkinje neuron causes the switch on of the deep cerebellar nuclei at a very precise time with a millisecond precision. Therefore, the cerebellum becomes a millisecond precision controller, addressing the idea that the cerebellum is a timing machine, generates precise timing correlations between uh, events, and predicts the precise time at which the second event will occur. So at this point, the controllers are already binding the cellular level properties with the system level properties and are addressing theory. So this is what we really appreciate of this development of the models that allow us to go into the link between cellular properties, system properties, and theory. Um, I skip this, and now I jump to the very last section, the uh, cerebellar models in the virtual brain. Um, the virtual brain is actually a, a construct that is based on principles of brain architecture. There are maps generated by uh, atlases and connected to the MRI uh, image uh, analysis theory in which the brain can be subdivided into nodes. Suppose the surface of the brain make it uh, done of nodes, and these nodes are connected through edges, and these edges are the connection lines, are the fiber tracts that connect the nodes. Okay, the virtual brain is based on this, and the nodes functionally can be 
represented uh, the neuronal masses or mean fields. These neuronal masses or mean fields are very simplified representations of what the area can do. And what they do is to generate waves. They do not generate spikes, they generate waves. So they generate analog signals. And so there are waves that influence the generation of other waves in other nodes, that generates other waves in other nodes. And as a whole, the virtual brain is a system of coupled oscillators in which there are waves that are transmitted from node to node and influence the coupling and the generation of these oscillations. So the idea is that in this way we can reproduce activity into a virtual brain. Now the point is that the virtual brain works up here, works at the level of between the model itself and the signal, for example, an MRI signal, but doesn't know very much about what the microcircuits are doing and about what the neurons are doing. The reason is that the neural mass or the mean field do not contain enough detail to extract information about the microcircuit and the neurons. So the idea is to begin to put this information inside. That's the frontier. Another point is that the virtual brain contains already the nodes of the cerebellum, but the nodes of the cerebellum are not normally used or connected. And the, the reason is twofold, because the generating tractography toward the cerebellum is not easy. There are many tricks and many problems about this tractography. So a proper connectivity needs to be analyzed in detail. And secondly, that the cerebellar neural mass or field is not probably the same as that of the cortex. So we have good reasons to believe it is absolutely not the same of that of the cortex. So we need to rebuild it to make it new. Otherwise, what do we get? We get probably a wrong uh, insertion of the cerebellum into the virtual brain. So in order to make it proper, we need to develop the neural mass first. So what we're doing, and you will see, is to uh, test this insertion of the neural mass and also to develop a specific neural mass or field, whatever it will be. Um, and the idea is more or less this, uh, to generate a neural mass that, uh, or field that uh, is uh, uh, representative of the cerebellar computation, is representative of the cerebellar connectivity, is inserted into the atlas of the cerebellum and is connected through nodes to the rest of the virtual brain. The process is ongoing. Um, this is an example, again, of, I uh, hope it works. Uh, this is an example that was developed by uh, Claudia. It's a simulation of a preliminary reconstruction of this uh, mean cerebellar field in which we have maintained properties like those that you see here. Uh, it is designed to allow adaptive filtering. You basically see the center surrounds pulsating. And uh, uh, we have the um, embedded uh, uh, coupled oscillators that should allow to connect with the cerebral cortex on specific uh, uh, wavelengths. Uh, it contains perceptrons that are actually the equivalent of the Purkinje neurons, and it should contain, not yet for the moment, plasticity rules that should allow to generate the weighting of the connectivity inside the network of uh, uh, the mean cerebellar field and with respect to the afferent pathways, for example, the cerebral cortex. So basically, this construction should allow to jump into the general uh, scheme for uh, virtual brain simulations with a specific representation of the cerebellum that has to be placed here. Um, all of this will be made clear. We have Spaze around here, and uh, uh, he will introduce the concept of the virtual brain. Then uh, Fulvia and Claudia will explain how this components of the virtual brain will be developed and embedded.
So this is the main story that will be uh, explained and elaborated in these days. Uh, and uh, there will be a lot of work, a lot of detail, a lot of hands-on uh, tutorials to try to understand better what all of this means in practice. Uh, I have to thank all the people working on the story. Uh, clearly, I'm presenting a big picture now, but there was a lot of work from many of us uh, and uh, um, in particular, in this context, I would like to thank people in the Neurocomputational Laboratory and Claudia first for all the work she also did for the organization of the hackathon, and then uh, Stefano and Stefano, Martina, Beatrice, Alberto, Alice, Alessandro. So, um, thank you very much for this participation to this meeting and uh, questions and uh, next step, uh, Simona, we have the coffee break now, yeah? Good. So if there are questions. Waiting for the coffee and uh, waiting for the continuation. Good. Uh, so I try to go a little bit more in details in the um, approach uh, we have in the lab to reconstruct the uh, cerebellar microcircuit. Um, so as a GDO said, we, uh, we try to um, put uh, uh, the main structural and functional features inside the uh, reconstructing network uh, in order to uh, somehow uh, be able to uh, match experimental data at multiple scales, because of course we have data at single cell level, but we have data at behavioral level. So it's a big challenge to try to put uh, and to create a network which is at the same time um, which at the same time meets the structural requirements, but also able to generate some uh, dynamic uh, properties and even some high-level functional behaviors. Uh, so we, we have different kinds of data, so in vitro, in vivo recordings, animal behavioral study, neuroimaging, and human clinical studies. So all these things needs to be uh, taken into consideration in the uh, reconstruction. So uh, we, um, we reconstruct the olive cerebellar circuit, taking into account the main property. So it's a modular network, so we have uh, a computational arc algorithm performed by each module in an um, architecture which connects this module in a specific uh, way. We have a specific uh, organization at the geometry level with uh, an isotropic feature which needs to be put into the rules of the reconstructed network and specific connection rules. Uh, we have different cell types with specific complex dynamics, so we need to differentiate uh, a lot of cell types different. So we have granule cell, Golgi cells, uh, molecular interneurons differentiated into basket and stellate cell. We have Purkinje cells, deep cerebellar nuclei, deep cerebellar nuclei interneurons, and then we have the inferior olive cells. So in this way, we, uh, we should be able to have a realistic geometry and so also uh, reflected into a realistic functional behaviors. Uh, as Egidio said, we have a lot of plasticity sites uh, with the short and long-term uh, synaptic rules uh, in different connections, and uh, uh, so in a distributed fashion, we try to put into the network these rules uh, matching some experimental data uh, coming uh, about the uh, plasticity behavior. Uh, we know if we want to scale up till the behavior generated by this network, we know that the cerebellum takes part to large-scale networks engaged in cognitive and motor control, and uh, of course this also reflected uh, in an interesting way uh, into the uh, 
pathological condition. So if we have some lesion in some structural or functional properties, it is reflected into a, a deficit in behaviors. We would like to have a realistic nature able to be manipulated also to generate uh, pathological uh, network so somehow we can go in understanding uh, which is the underlying mechanism responsible for some misbehavior. For instance, in motor domain, we know that the cerebellum plays a critical role in motor learning and uh, Usually it is responsible for tuning, timing, and gain of motor responses, and it's able to predict and compensate perturbation. So it is able to, uh, for instance, in a uh, reaching task with a force field uh, perturbing the behavior, it is able to uh, understand and learn the uh, dynamic field and correct it uh, in a predictive way in order to go back to the desired and optimal uh, trajectory and perform the required task. So we need, of course, repetition of the same task and let the uh, cerebellum uh, change thanks to the plasticity, and which means to uh, tune the output and the behavior. Uh, during the, uh, when there is a lesion, uh, of course these features of the behavior are uh, mm, perturbed and for instance we have uh, in ataxic patients a lot of deficit in compensating uh, dynamic perturbation so we don't, the patient is uh, not able to go back to an optimal trajectory or the learning takes much more long time or it's less precise, of course it depends where the, uh, the, the perturbation is in the underlying mechanism now at, at level of the neural network. So this is the framework Egidio presented. So we have uh, modeling parts and experimental parts associated, of course, at all the scale. Uh, we uh, can reconstruct realistic uh, single cell model and we, uh, which is also useful to uh, validate and to develop uh, simplified single point neurons, which are much more uh, efficient in computational terms and they try to keep all the main uh, features we want to have in the uh, neuron uh, behaviors. Uh, after me, Stefano will present more details about the realistic model developed in neuron, so with uh, uh, the experimental data and the uh, optimization of the parameters of all the dendritic and axonal and soma compartments to get uh, single cell detail model. So for instance, in this case, we have Purkinje cell and Golgi cell represented, but this is the approach for all the cell types I have said uh, just a few slides before. We uh, also developed uh, with Alicia and other people in the team a uh, simplified single point neuron, but uh, uh, still able to, uh, depending on the parameter set, but able to uh, show uh, the, uh, a rich electroresponsive phenotype. So depending on which cell type, we can define different parameter set and we can get uh, a lot of properties which shape also the function of the network. So we want to have autorhythm, subthreshold oscillation, resonance, phase reset, uh, depolarization induced bursting, spike frequency adaptation, and rebound burst after hyperpolarization. So uh, with the same parameter set, depending on which cell type we want to uh, model, we, uh, we can exploit this uh, single uh, um, point neuron model, but still able to have a lot of uh, uh, properties which are fundamental in the uh, development of the network dynamics. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, single cell needs to be uh, embedded into a scaffold which uh, uh, 
is built, is uh, based on three main steps. So we have cell placement, connectivity, and then depending on which cell type we are putting into the different points in the volume, we can have, uh, we can exploit pi nest or pi neuron and have functional network dynamics, eventually in closed loop if we uh, do multiple repetition of some task and if we want to uh, provide uh, back to the system uh, the output, uh, the, the network generated. Uh, so we have uh, um, a scaffold uh, code with uh, a configuration file able to be uh, really flexible, so a lot of features uh, and parameters can be easily modified since, uh, because of course something is, is known, but something is really uh, still a sort of guess, so we need, uh, the, the scaffold needs to be ready to host new information as soon as the experimental data provide us with new information about density of the neuron, placement of the neuron, uh, encumbrance of each neuron, and which also shape, of course, the connectivity rules and so on. So we, uh, we can modify this parameter and then we can create, compile, which means to create uh, the architecture, so the reconstruction of the network, so where each neuron is into a predefined volume, in which layers, and how each neuron is connected to the other. So we have this uh, huge file, HDF file, with placement and connectivity uh, matrices. Uh, of course, once this is reconstruction, uh, this is reconstructed, we can provide and define stimulation pattern and depending on what we want to test, and then we can do a uh, simulate step where uh, we can uh, adapt depending if we are using pi neuron on pi nest, so of course we, we need to provide different parameters, and then we can, with the same scaffold but uh, uh, hosting different single cell type, we can run uh, a uh, functional simulation. We, we will see the details of the codes and the different adapters for the uh, simulators in the tutorials. So uh, the user can define the volume he wants to reconstruct. Uh, we have some constraints from physiology about the layers and the thickness of each layers. Uh, we, we have seen which cell types we want to uh, put uh, uh, into the network and we know uh, we can define the density, the radius of the soma, the extension of the dendritic tree, the extension of the axonal span, uh, and of course we can define some morphology features if we are using uh, uh, detailed uh, single uh, uh, neurons. And then we can define uh, connection uh, types, so uh, which source neuron to which target neuron, and of course we can define convergence, divergence ratio, or uh, other properties uh, related to uh, touch, to detection of touch among neurons put uh, into the, the volume. Uh, then we have, the uh, we have to choose which simulator we want to use, which device, which uh, uh, recordings we need to have, uh, depending also on the size, of course, of the network. So we have the placement of all these cell types. Uh, different strategies can be used, so we can have self-avoiding random walk, particle placement, parallel array placements, depending how the cells are effectively placed into the uh, cerebellar structure. Uh, for instance, here, it's an example of uh, uh, the uh, placement uh, following the self-avoiding random walk algorithm, or we can have, uh, uh, we can choose, depending for each cell type, a different strategy. In this case, the other one presented here is the particle placement. Uh, which is based on detect, um, a random position, then we have uh, a check of uh, collision among cells, and then we can compute a sort of repulsive force among them to replace the uh, neurons which, are, uh, which uh, previously collide each other. So we, then at the end, we get 
a complete placement of the number of cells we want, so meeting the uh, desired density, uh, without any overlaps and meeting the constraints uh, with the distance among uh, neurons. For the Purkinje cell, for instance, we know they are placed in a planar fashion, so we have a different strategies for this cell type. Uh, we, we can infer the planar density of this cell type uh, since we have experimental data on this. So we uh, can estimate how many Purkinje in, uh, we have in the surface. Uh, and then we can define an angle uh, because we know that we have uh, uh, an angle uh, inclination for these placements. Uh, and uh, in this way, we can place the Purkinje cell close each other, but without, for instance, overlapping among the dendritic trees uh, of adjacent cells, which is uh, something that uh, comes from evidence from experimental data. Uh, so, at the end of the placement step, we have the 3D volume with all the cell types. Uh, each one has a specific 3D position. Uh, then, given this position, we can apply the connection rules. Uh, again, we can choose different strategies depending on uh, which cell model we are using. So, we can have uh, a sort of statistical approach using convergence and divergence ratio, uh, intersection among dendritic and axonal fields in general, or we can have more precise uh, touch detection among segments of the morphologies. Of course, it depends uh, depending on uh, which neuron we have put into the, uh, the points of the volume. Uh, an important step, of course, is the input to this uh, model. So we have the MOSI fibers uh, taking into the cerebellum the signals. So uh, in, it's an important step to define a realistic branching, which needs to be based on concept as a signal expansion and recombination which uh, provides some uh, um, rules on how to uh, branch the MOSI fiber connected to the glomeruli inside the granular layer. So we, we know some uh, spatial anisotropy uh, in the uh, extension, let's say, of this cluster, which receives the same MOSI fiber input. We know uh, a sort of ratio between number of glomeruli and MOSI fiber. So we can, uh, we have uh, defined this algorithm and then we have uh, created this connection among the MOSI fiber and the glomeruli which receive the same uh, MOSI fiber signals. Uh, so respected the principle of signal expansion and recombination. Uh, this is an example of connection type between stellates and Purkinje cells meeting uh, the uh, principle, the number of convergence and divergence. And this is uh, uh, the same connection type, still late to Purkinje, but uh, uh, using and exploiting the morphologies, so putting the synaptics on the uh, dendritic segments or axonal segments. Uh, this is an example of the granular layer. So we have the granule cells with the ascending axon and the parallel fiber. Uh, connected to Golgi cells. And this visualization comes from the Madrid group, Oscar and Susanna. Uh, so, of course, it's also this part, the visualization is a huge issue since we have more than 1,000 dendritic compartments for each cell. So even this uh, touch detection and visualization is something that needs to be optimized for the computational uh, loads. Uh, then, with uh, Alicia and Dimitri from APFL, we are working also to scale up this uh, scaffold approach. So, not just, uh, let's say, a cube uh, volume, but of course, we need to map on the real uh, geometry, so take into account all the folding. So, we are uh, using somehow the same approach, so particle placement in a realistic uh, um, geometry of the cerebellar regions. And then, of course, we need to adapt an oriented uh, 
the, uh, the rules for the connection to create uh, uh, the proper uh, connection rules take into account that the ascending axis and the parallel fiber can bend depending on uh, the real surface of the uh, cerebellum met in the uh, real brain uh, atlas. Um, then once the, the, the scaffold is built, uh, we can, of course, run. This simulation was done in PyNest. So we provided some uh, inputs at the level of mossy fiber glomeruli with specific uh, burst, uh, which can represent some uh, uh, meaningful uh, sensory inputs to the cerebellum. And then we can record and uh, generate dynamics in the, all the populations of the, of the cerebellum. Uh, and we can see if we can reproduce and like spatio-temporal dynamics uh, characteristic uh, which are really uh, needed to have uh, a realistic uh, cerebellar dynamics. So like centers around pattern, uh, oscillation and coupled oscillation into the granular layer and uh, um, different things. Uh, then we need uh, to embed plasticity to make the cerebellum plastic, so also to make it uh, uh, able to generate learning in some closed loop uh, uh, task. So now we have embedded two long term, uh, four, sorry, long term plasticity rules in, different, in four different sites with a bi directional approach. So we have both, both long term depression and uh, potentiation, but not sim symmetric, so specifically the two uh, potentiation or depression of the synaptic strength is modulated in a different way as uh, suggested by experimental data. So uh, in the scaffold code, we can uh, switch from a static synapsis to a plastic one. So we embed specific modules we have created, uh, in this case, in PyNest for these rules, and we can have a customized kernel of, uh, a short, uh, of um, spike time dependent plasticity, which can be triggered by teaching signals. So we need, for each uh, learning rule, we need specific uh, inputs. And to compute the time of the spikes, uh, they are involved in these uh, plastic change of the weights of the synaptic strength of the connections. Uh, of course, with different time and uh, decay, depending on uh, which uh, uh, neurons we are taking into account in, this co in the connection. Uh, in this case, for instance, we have about uh, one, uh, um, 100,000 cells more than one, uh, 11 million of a connection and about uh, uh, 9, million, 9 million of connection are plastic. So uh, we have introduced this uh, uh, plasticity into a lot of connections since uh, uh, because the parallel fibers going into Purkinje cell and uh, MLI, molecular interneurons, are really a lot. So they are the most of the connection within the cerebellum. Uh, then, last thing is that we try to put everything in a, a meaningful task in behavioral terms. So one task is the eye-blinking classical conditioning. So we provide the network with uh, a conditioned stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus following two different paths to go into the cerebellum. So through the mossy fiber and through the climbing fiber coming from the inferior olive. They go into the, uh, the cerebellum and they are processed and they trigger plasticity. And this, in behavioral terms, means that the uh, subject, uh, after repetition of the presentation of these two stimuli uh, with a precise inter-stimuli interval among them, is able to learn this uh, stimuli association and to uh, respond uh, to uh, create a response to this association in a predictive way. So in the case of eye blinking classical condition, uh, conditioning, after a while uh, it, it receives uh, a condition stimulus like a sound uh, 
after, let's say, 500 uh, milliseconds, it receives an air path into the eye. After few repetitions, the cerebellum is able to trigger a conditional response, so a blink of the eye, even before that the air path comes to the cerebellum. So it's a timing association among stimuli driven by the behavior of the cerebellum, we change the response thanks to the plasticity embedded into the network. Uh, this is a, a simple behavioral task, but there are, it's a, a really a good paradigm to test the behavior of the network since we have experimental data on the underlying mechanism, neural mechanism, which uh, evolve during the, this kind of task. And uh, so in this case, we have the uh, recording from Purkinje and from deep cerebellar nuclei. And then we have a sort of decoding of the eye closure of the blink from the uh, deep cerebellar nuclei, which change from the start of the learning after, uh, to the end of the learning, let's say, after 10, 20, 50 repetition of the, of the task. Uh, this is also used as a biomarker for cerebellar disease, so counting, let's say, uh, monitoring the curve of the generation of this condition response uh, is also a way to uh, test some cerebellar disease like ataxia, where some patients can be uh, really uh, impaired in generating this uh, response or can be uh, just uh, let's say they need more repetition to get uh, a, a learning curve similar to the healthy one. Uh, so we have used the scaffold to test these, uh, uh, these paradigms. And also we started as proof of concept to do some manipulation of the model, like for instance, taking uh, uh, away, let's say, so uh, the number, uh, reducing the density of the Purkinje cell, uh, which is something uh, associated to some uh, spinocerebellar ataxia where they uh, reported a decreased cerebellar cortical volume, so a decreased number of Purkinje cells. And we can uh, get a different uh, learning curve of the uh, condition response. So uh, if we um, create a certain amount of lesion in the Purkinje cell into the model, uh, we get less conditional response decoded from the uh, deep cerebellar nuclei spike patterns. Um, and of course, this uh, deficit uh, is re uh, directly linked to the amount of lesion we are putting into the model. So we can also explore uh, a sort of uh, sites of the lesion and uh, uh, amount uh, to quantify the level of uh, deficit into the behavior. So this is a very big pow power of the model in, uh, in trying to associate the underlying mechanisms to uh, the production of the behavior. Um, of course, in this case, uh, we had a reference in a clinical study with a reference uh, behavioral outcome from a patient with this kind of uh, uh, reduced cerebellar cortical volume uh, with a, a different uh, um, generation of condition response and also different latency, so a different timing in the response of the, of the network. Uh, this was just a, a slide about the uh, high performance computing, of course, we are using to perform this kind of simulation because they last uh, a long time, because we need, for instance, uh, uh, 20 repetitions, each one about one second. So we need uh, uh, a long-lasting simulation, monitoring not only the, uh, the activity of each neurons, but even the change of the weight of the synaptic strength in the plastic connections we have put into the model. Uh, of course, this is a, a work, for a teamwork. So again, we have uh, a lot of people from uh, UniPV and collaborations from Polytechnico and, and other uh, universities. Thanks a lot.
Uh, any question, curiosity, something to be clarified? Or anyway, you will see more details of the code, of the reconstruction of the network running, uh, and other things, even in the tutorials. Uh, so let's say, yeah. So uh, to generate, you mean the first step of compile. So when we create the HDF file, uh, to generate uh, depends, of course, of the size of the network. In this case, uh, about 100,000 neurons, uh, like 10 minutes, something, to guys, Robin, Stefano, more or less, <laughs> to generate uh, these uh, files. Basically, it's a connection matrix with each row uh, is the ID of the source neuron and the ID of the post neuron, so uh, more or less this. Of course, if we scale up, we, re we really need uh, parallel, parallel APC running, even for the compilation, not only for the simulation part, so. Okay. So I think Stefano, which goes more in detail about the pi neuron uh, single cell model. So I will talk about uh, the single cell uh, models. So we are here to talk about models. Uh, this will be the most used word in the entire three days. But why we talk about models? Because there is a, a reality, and we want to understand how the reality works. And the only way to do that is to extrapolate the information from the reality and to transform it into a model. But there are so many different types of models. There are dozens of different types of models. So one has to decide which one he wants to uh, produce, which one are the data, which one is the uh, reality he wants to understand. But uh, all the models, there can be dozens of different types, they are all based on the same single concept which is the word model, which is taken from the Latin word modulus, which means measure. So everything, we have to measure the reality to understand it, to make uh, uh, theoretical, uh, theoretical models, computational models. One can start with a, the real, a real construction and then do a blueprint, so a model, a drawing of the, all the parts that compose a, a building. And then one can do a scale model, which is a, a, a smaller version. Or right now, we can even do a computer version of a, a, a building and put that into a video game. So everything starts with a measurement. And in, in this case, we, do the, we, do the, we can do the opposite. We can start with a 3D model of an object we create inside a computer or a scale model of something and then put it uh, on a piece of paper, draw out every single possible piece that we need, and from there build a bridge or something like that. So in some cases, the model can be used in both ways, from the reality to the model and from the model to the reality. In the case, of course, of a, a single cell, there is only one direction. But another thing that accumulate all the modeling approaches uh, is the concept of uh, approximation. So we have uh, a reality, we have tools to measure the reality, but it, depending on these tools, the reality can be simple as taking uh, uh, the size of a column, of a floor, or to see how big is a single cell. So we can measure something in the meters or in micrometers and so on. So the approximation in, is, can be for the tools we use, for the theories, for the data source and, and everything. In the case of a single cell model based on real information, I have to start finding the, the, the information where? From the animal model. Why from a model? So starting to do a model from a model seems strange. Because in this case, the reality is us. So we want to know how the, our brain, our cerebellum, our uh, cells are working. But the problem is uh, with the non-invasive techniques, uh, one can understand only a part of the whole, so one cannot uh, understand how a single cell works. So we have to use a model, so an animal, that is similar to us. It, we think it, it has the same properties, the same uh, characteristics to take the information. Without information, we cannot do the model. <laughs> 
And then all the information can be transformed into a mathematical model. So all the information is stored inside equations. And those equations can be solved when uh, we run the equation on a computer. So we need to use a programming language to transform the uh, mathematical model into something that can be solved by uh, a computer. A simulation, in the end, what is, is uh, I have the reality, I see something that happens in the reality, I create a model, and I want to see that the model is able to replicate what I see in reality. So a simulation is nothing else that run a specific uh, uh, behavior that I see and see if the model is capable of doing the same. So this is my recipe to do a, a single cell realistic model with the, the program that is called Neuron. So I start usually with a 3D morphology. So what's a 3D morphology? We know that all the neurons have specific uh, shapes, which are important because they dictate the functionality of a neuron. And of course, it has to be taken from tissue. So it cannot be faked in a way. It has to be uh, taken from tissue. Can be used an equivalent morphology based on statistical data, but is usually relegated to specific, very small cases. Uh, of course, more section require more computational power because uh, uh, the equation are more and more, more detail, more equation, more computational power, and so on. The passive properties uh, usually are the axial uh, resistance, membrane capacitance, and so on. They scale with the morphology, so more section, more power required to solve the, uh, the passive properties, but they have a lesser impact uh, than the active properties. So for active properties, we usually mean the ionic channels. So to give you a number, there are over 400 different types of ionic channels. Uh, one third are voltage dependent. Of, uh, uh, usually in a model, there are 15, 20 different ionic channels. Some with, are more relevant, some are relegated in some portion of the model and so on. So the main point to do a, a single cell model is to uh, find the conductance of this, the channel. So it's the conductance of the channel is how many ion channels will pass through the, uh, the channels in a set of time. The problem is there is no technique on the planet that can provide you with such a data. There isn't. One can uh, um, find the information of a, a total possible current, maybe for the sum of a cell, but not for the dendrites, not for the axon. So the main point, as we'll see in the tutorial in the afternoon, is to find something that is called the conductance. So it's a, a density, a current density on a section. And this can be done in two ways, which is the model, model construction. Uh, it can be manually fitted, so it means that I will search for these parameters uh, in a, a trial and error way, so I do, I set the channels, the morphology, and I will try to see if a behavior that was seen in the experiment can be replicated with the model. If not, I have to change the conductance on all the, on the uh, ionic channels on all the model to match the uh, actual behavior. Or if it's able to reproduce, I can search for other behaviors and so on. Or it can be used as uh, an automatic system, an optimization system, which, is, which is, has to be run on an HPC, so uh, on high-performing computing, because it, uh, it does dozens of simulations at the same time uh, in parallel. So one can literally use 1,000 simulations at the same time on, the, on, a, on a cluster. The results, more or less, is the same. It depends on the, on the complexity of the model and so on. The first step, the, first, the last step of a model is the critical one, is the validation. I create a model, I'm sure it works, everything is fine. I will start using uh, additional data that was not used for the construction to see if the model is valid. So the validation point is to have a model that is able to reproduce more results than the one I used for building it. And this is the main uh, point uh, for uh, doing a, a single cell realistic model, because if somebody touches it, for example, if I complete a model and I validate the model, but somebody starts touching the morphology or the passive properties of the channel, the model is no more valid. So just to give you a pair of examples, these are morphologies, 
they are not in scale, so they, they are only uh, an example of, uh, of uh, morphologies. They usually use the same part, dendrites, soma, axon, but it's the construction, it's the diversity that makes the behavior. For example, a Purkinje cell, which is the first one uh, with, the, with the A, it has a big dendritic tree. The granular cell is very small, has only four dendrites. So the form of the cell will dictate how the cell reacts to synaptic activity, intrinsic properties, and so on. Another point is the membrane and the ionic channels. Of course, for me, the, uh, the image on the, uh, is a, a cell. The idea, the dream, is to create a model of a cell like the one in the, the picture. Is it possible? Yes. Right now, no, because the uh, quantity of data and the computational power is over the roof. So maybe in 10 years uh, it will be possible. For the moment, it's not. But it's possible to uh, uh, model a, a membrane and the channels. Yes, it takes weeks of computational time and weeks of real time to do a single simulation of a single section. So again, it can be done. Yes, it takes a lot of time and more or less for the moment is useless. So we have to use something more uh, with a higher speed of resolution, which is uh, the Hodgkin Axley model, which is a mathematical model. It's called uh, the contact contact based model and is used to define the uh, how the ionic channels are described so they can be solved in a reasonable time. Of course, an Hodgkin axis model is a, a deterministic approach because every time one can be sure that the results are always the same because the channels are fixed. There are other ways, we will see them uh, this afternoon, called Markovian chains that are stochastic. So there will be some difference in the results. Of course, we are still using the cable theory, which is now 150 years old, to solve how an, uh, an action potential is transmitting along uh, uh, an axon at end rights. So to put that, everything together, we use Neuron, which is a, a simulator. It was done in the 90s. It's always updated, increased, expanded, and so on. Uh, it isn't the best uh, uh, graphical interface on the planet, but uh, it's a, a, all around. It's a simulation environment. You can use that for do a, a single cell, a very small single cell, or a complex, uh, complex uh, uh, single cell, or a network. Uh, now we can be used uh, for a biochemical reaction too. Uh, originally, Neuron contained a language called Neuron, of course, which was like uh, a C, with a uh, C-like syntax, uh, which was superseded by Python. Ten years ago, the uh, author decided to use Python to implement Python inside Neuron, which is faster, which is better. It can be written by even for a biologist is a great uh, uh, language because uh, if it works, works. If it doesn't it says it doesn't work, so you have to change the code until you are sure that everything is running fine. And of course, the computational power. Of course, doing a single cell model, it doesn't require the first machine on the planet. This, uh, the first, the second, and the third uh, clusters currently on the planet, so the best one. To do a single cell, one can use uh, even a laptop is more than enough. But if, if we start adding more data, more complexity, or doing an optimization, or something else, we need to use uh, a cluster, which in the end is a, a, a huge cabinet filled with uh, CPUs, uh, memory, hard drive, uh, and connectivity. So, my uh, favorite cell is the uh, Purkinje cell, of course. And uh, uh, more or less 200 years ago, the only way to see a cell from a tissue was using a microscope. The fun fact is that uh, Purkinje had to wait 10 years for uh, receiving a microscope because the scientist, the physiologist of the time, said it was useless to see the cell. Instead, it was certain that looking at the cell was the best way to understand, to have a, an initial model of how a cell <laughs> looked like. So he was able to draw the soma, 
of the Purkinje cell to define something called granule, so granule cells. But he, unfortunately for him, Golgi was not around at the time, so he was able only to see the soma. He lost what a Purkinje cell is, looks like. He was unable to see the dendritic tree. But as I said before, the dendritic tree is important for the Purkinje cell because it, it's a, a, a marker of this cell. It is a, this extensive dendritic tree that makes a Purkinje a Purkinje. So for the model, uh, I used a 1990, 90, 90, 90, uh, 20 years old uh, uh, morphology, which was done in the 90s. And it was composed only by the soma and the dendrites, but they were taken from tissue, so from a guinea pig in this case. And I've added some, play, some uh, part like the axon initial segment, which is now known as the most important part of a neuron, the axon, all pieces that, uh, uh, yes, from a point, uh, they require more computational power to be solved, but they are in the reality. So a model without the axon, for me personally, it is not possible to even think about that, or a, a, a Purkinje cell without, without dendrites. And then, one, uh, one has uh, the, the morphology, we can start uh, adding passive properties, so uh, membrane capacitance, resistance, uh, uh, the leakage current, and so on, and everything has to be taken from published data or from experiment. Nothing in this kind of model can be faked, can be uh, guessed in a way. One has to be certain that everything is written somewhere, and has to be. One can choose which data to use, but the concept is no fake data, no data that is added without a proof of existence. And of course, one has to read thousands of papers to find out all the single ionic channels to place in the model and which type, if there is a mod file for it, so the actual uh, uh, kinetics and so on, and where it's located, uh, and how much is uh, the actual uh, current, that is something that has to be found out with the model. So in the, in the end, the centrality of the experimental data is still something that is uh, fundamental. One cannot do uh, this kind of model without experiments. So the animal model will be here for a long time until we find a way to find every single last bit of data. But that is, will take a lifetime to do. And then one can build the model and run the simulation and see if everything is fine, if the axon is transmitting correctly or if the channels are in the right or wrong place and so on. And the beauty of this kind of model is that one can perform something that in reality cannot be done. For example, if I record from the SOMA, in reality I can do that. I can do a double recordings from the soma from one dendrites. In this case, I can, re I can record from every single section, something that cannot be done with an experiment. Or I can see specific activity between the dendrites, the soma, the axon, and so on. And of course, I can add synaptic activity. And this is like adding a, a completely new level to the game because uh, finding and creating a working model is more or less an easy, easy task. Uh, adding the synaptic activity can prove that the model is wrong or, or is right or there is something more. So one can match the data from an uh, experimentalist, uh, can try combination that had uh, never been tested, and so on. Now, this, uh, in this afternoon, I will talk about the cerebellar granule cells. So it's uh, uh, the most common cells in the entire uh, ne central nervous system. It's very small, very simple, because it has only four dendrites, one soma, and one axon, very long axon. So this, is the, this will be the uh, base for the tutorial. Uh, they receive information, of course, from uh, the, the, the external part of, the, brain, of the, the cerebellum, and they convey all the information to the uh, Purkinje cells. So in this case, this model was, instead of doing that, uh, doing the, uh, the, um, to find the conductances manually, it was used a, uh, an optimization technique. So this is only an example, it's not the exact uh, 
type of uh, optimization. But the concept is uh, an optimizer works uh, in a way that I have a, a, a population. Each uh, individual in a population will be a model itself. So every single uh, model will receive a certain uh, combination of channels. So the conductance is, he has to find. And uh, on, a on a cluster, every single individual be will be simulated. And then the simulation, I will check for specific uh, co uh, parameters called features, which are, uh, the, for example, the frequency of the response and so on. The best one will be taken part, the worst one will be taken away, and the new uh, population will be a sum of the new, the best one obtained in the previous generation, and some of the original population put together, mixed with the uh, crossing over, and then there will be a new population, a new round, etc., etc., etc. So in the end, I'll have a population with mixed uh, results, which can be the best results matching the experimental data, or the worst results completely different from the experimental data. So this is just an example of the uh, ground cell. As you can see, there is a, a long list of uh, features that I can, I want to obtain from the model. So I define that uh, the frequency is in a certain range, the amplitude, uh, the spike amplitude, the uh, width, uh, the height of the spike, and so on. So these are all the information needed for the optimizer to find the correct results. And of course, uh, when the model is complete and is working right, uh, one can start searching for something that was not planned. For example, in this case, for the granular cell, the same model I will show you uh, in the tutorial, uh, it was possible to understand that the concentration of calcium in the dendrites is critical for the uh, cell uh, to have different results. So for example, if I increase the calcium in entry in the dendrites, the cell will behave in a different way. So I have a, a regular granule cell. The typical granule cell is regular. In the case of uh, uh, the calcium, if I have a small entry of calcium, the cell is regular. If I increase the calcium entry from the dendrites, the cell starts to behave in a more bursting way, and then it can completely collapse and become silent. So we saw these results using this optimization technique. So it can be done manually, yes. It takes only more time because usually one search for the most common result. So to search for something different, one can use uh, this kind of uh, system. And all of this information of the behaviors are based on experimental done in the lab. So to conclude, I want to remember that today and tomorrow there will be to, uh, tutorials about the granular cell, so the single cell uh, model for the first day, and uh, an optimization part tomorrow for the second uh, part of the tutorial. Finish. <laughs> Questions? Uh, usually, uh, doing too many uh, generations is bad because it starts to bring out uh, uh, strange results. So usually, I run an optimization for a certain number of generations. I see the uh, fitness value. If it's uh, uh, descending, so usually the fitness value starts from a, a high uh, level because uh, it doesn't match the experimental data. So from that point on, the idea is that uh, if it finds new uh, results that are better, the fitness has to go down. When it reaches a point that the fitness is stable, it doesn't change anymore, or, at, or in some cases it can start going up, then when I do another optimization, I cut the optimization with a low, uh, lower number of uh, uh, generations. So more or less, uh, uh, the idea is to do the first uh, uh, optimization with uh, the highest number of uh, individuals and the um, highest number of generations, and from there to reduce the number of generations if I saw that the models are correct, of course. Okay.
So I can start. Uh, so I will, uh, with this uh, short talk, I will actually complete a little bit the previous talk. So I will just uh, focus my attention on the biophysical part of the um, synapses that connect the neurons. So you, you have already seen a lot of uh, the cerebellar circuit. You have seen already quite a lot of also about the biophysics of the cells. But of course, uh, this is quite fascinating, but we, we, don't, we don't have to forget about that uh, the, um, the connectivity is actually the synaptic connectivity, and almost all connections are made of chemi chemical synapses. And uh, uh, with a biophysical approach, uh, it is possible to extract a lot of data from uh, the dynamics of the synapses. And uh, when you deal with uh, experimental data, you learn that there is a lot already ongoing at these uh, small contacts. And uh, just to summarize a little bit how the synaptic transmission goes on and how we can uh, deal with it in order to build models. So let's take these pictures in which, uh, is there any pointer, actually? No? No pointer? So actually, uh, I will mouse. Okay, so basically what happens is that you start from a presynaptic voltage, so you have an action potential in the presynaptic terminal, which is up here, and uh, then uh, the presynaptic voltage causes a cascade of reactions, so there's an entry of calcium in the compartment, in the presynaptic compartment, and a lot of uh, proteins are activated by the, the calcium that enters the compartment. And finally, you have the release of neurotransmitter. In order to reach this, in order to uh, achieve the release of neurotransmitter, so an, a series of cascade of reactions are needed. And then finally, you, you get the release of neurotransmitter and the activation of the postsynaptic current and the voltages. So uh, there is just here, uh, just to note, that I depicted a, uh, an additional trace with this dashed right curve. This is just to, to, to say that the transmitter concentration is actually quite close to a uh, simple pulse. This is, uh, can give quite a lot of advantages when one, one, uh, one wants to simplify the models, and it turns out that the response of the, the postsynaptic current is quite comparable. And so uh, the, the best way to, I mean, the standard way to address the, the modeling part is to translate the synaptic models in a scheme which is uh, basically a kinetic scheme in which the transition from a closed uh, silent state goes to the open state thanks to an opening rate that is multiplied by the, uh, the amount of uh, neurotransmitter that you have in the synaptic cleft. So if you don't have neurotransmission, the, uh, of course the concentration will be zero and you have no transition to the open state. Then, in order to uh, maintain the same conductance-based approach, what you do is to write an equation, an equation that uh, takes into account the fact that uh, you, you are using this conductance-based approach, so you write the current, the synaptic current, in terms of the difference of the voltage, voltage respect to the reversal potential, and you mu multiply it by the open state of the, uh, the, the synapse. So it's, the framework is quite similar to the one uh, proposed by Hodgkin and Axley, the, the one we, uh, Stefano just uh, spoke about. And, well, to make it very simple, uh, consider two states, the closed and the open state. So we have a very simple kinetic scheme with two states. So uh, with such kind of scheme, you can actually mimic the neurotransmission, the, I mean, uh, uh, the synaptic response. So uh, there is a, a fast grow to the, the peak and then a simple decay to baseline. And this is already a way to, to, to solve and to deal with synaptic transmission. If you have a uh, constant pulse, so neurotransmitter uh, concentration is constant for a uh, short time, then um, you can also solve it analytically, and this has quite a lot of advantage if you want to speed up the simulation. 
And, well, this is just to summarize that you have a category of uh, type of receptors and synapses in the cerebellum. You have AMP and MDA, GABA A. Well, this is widespread. You have this kind of synapse everywhere. But this is just to summarize that the fact that we use this kind of scheme in, uh, in our studies in the past with, uh, with a team of A.G. D'Angelo. There is just to one thing to notice that uh, for the NMDA receptor, actually, there's a small difference because in addition to the standard equation, you have also the term that translates a magnesium block. So this is another phenomenon that is going on and uh, you have to take into account and uh, which introduce some additional dynamics, some rectification in the current. So if you look at the current elicitor minus 70 and minus 40, you have a very small current at minus 70 which is explained by the sigmoidal curve you see on the, on the right. And in addition to that, there is another uh, aspect to consider. So when you stimulate repetitively the, the synapse, you can uh, generate quite easily some uh, other regimes which are quite interesting if you deal with information processing in, in, in the circuit. So there's short-term depression going on and there's short-term facilitation. And both kind of uh, behavior are well known in the cerebellum. And uh, in particular, at some synapses, it's known that short-term depression is uh, prevailing, for example, at the mossy fiber to granule cell, also the uh, Purkinje cells to the DCN synapses, while the STF, so the short-term facilitation, is prevailing at the, par the parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapses. And uh, why do those, why those function? And this is because when you deal with postsynaptic dynamics, you have to consider that there are different open states. So if you go uh, to, to the very biological uh, details, so there are single bound and doubly bound states, so meaning that you have two states where the GABA channel can be opened. And the transition from R, so R is actually, I should change the, the, the letter, but. Uh, you move from R to R star or to R2 star, then, uh, um, I mean, the reaction is quite different because in the singly bound state, the affinity, meaning the sensibility to the, the GABA receptor, is quite low, while it's much ho higher to the doubly bound state. So if you uh, perturb the synapse, the synapse, you activate the synapse, it's more easy, easy to go to the doubly bound state. And the doubly bound state is actually a slower state, and as is shown on the right, so you have the doubly bound state, which decays quite slowly to the baseline, while the singly bound state decays quite faster. So that means that you have two modalities for this receptor to decay to the baseline. One is fast, the other is uh, slow. And well, if you consider that the um, diffusion process, uh, when it takes over in the, in the synaptic cleft, cleft introduce uh, a concentration of GABA, which is not constant across the entire synapse, then you, you can understand that there are some part of the synapse where the receptor will be activated much easier, easily in the doubly bound state, while on the border of the synaptic disk, for example, it will be much easier to activate the synapse in the singly bound state because the affinity is much lower. Well, this is just to say that if you wa want to translate some data from biology to the models, you can encounter these kind of problems because maybe the model at the level of the kinetic scheme is, is correct, but then if you want to, to bring it directly to the, the synapse, to the real synapse, you, the, there can be some problems when you match it. And uh, you have to think about a little bit more and uh, maybe introduce also the diffusion in the synaptic cleft. Otherwise, you need some other ad additional simplification. And, uh, well, diffusion is also a process that goes on quite, uh, quite a lot in the, in the cerebellum, of course, because well, we know that there is a structure which is called glomerulus, and the glomerulus is quite a complex unit. It's located at the, at, at the entry of the cerebellum, so uh, where you have a lot of synapses that impinge in the same structure. It's a closed structure in which uh, you actually have a mixture of GABA and uh, glutamate, and uh, you have a crosstalk between the, the, the two um, synaptic uh, properties, so uh, they can also influence each other. And um, so, in order to include, I mean, to model this process, what we did years ago already, 
is to introduce uh, a synapse in which we consider the direct uh, process of the release, which is the standard one we have seen before, but we also in, in, uh, introduce a, an indirect pathway. So the indirect pathway comes from glutamate that you fuse from other synapses in the glomerulus. So we consider that there are other processes going on that contribute to the release of neurotransmitter in, and to the activation of the post synaptic receptors. And we can, well, generalize the equation for the release of glutamate just by writing an additional term which accounts for the indirect uh, contribute. Well, why we did this, it, uh, basically it was because uh, we wanted to explain some data we had in the lab in which we were able to uh, induce LTP in the experiments, so long-term potentiation. And uh, on the left, what we have is uh, a control condition, an LTP condition, so it's the exactly the same cell in which we in induce LTP. What you can clearly see is that the first spike, so the stimulation current was the same, but you can clearly see is that when you stimulate the cell, you get a first spike which is anticipated with respect to the control condition. And that was quite systematic across different conditions, across different cells. So LTP is ultimately uh, regulating the timing of the first spike. And in the cerebellum, timing is, quite, is really critical, as you have seen before, and you will see it along the hackathon uh, workshop. And in order to explain that, we, we try to simulate the process without the indirect uh, contribution, and we never managed to explain the experimental data. So thanks uh, actually to the indirect component, we found that if we change the release probability of the, of the direct and the indirect component, it, it turns out that the entire uh, synapse is, I mean, not only the, the synapse that is facing the postsynaptic receptors, but also the other synapses are potentiated while you, you induce this LTP uh, in the synapse. So it's kind of collective potentiation. So when we think about potentiation, actually, in these kind of structures, the potentiation is not only localized to the, the single synapse, but it's also uh, extended to other synapses in the same structure. This is just to say that uh, there is uh, beyond the neurons, connectivity, etc. there is also uh, complex things happening at this level in the cerebellum. And what about uh, stochasticity? So Stefano just mentioned before, I don't know exactly what you are going to do, but I mean, it's just mentioning the, the relevance here uh, of stochasticity in the model. So for single models, uh, for hodgkin huxley neural models, uh, you know that the, you, you write the equation without any source of noise. And it basically works pretty well. Also, if you perform experiments, the, 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 the jitter, or the noise, it's pretty small. And well, but uh, wh why do, does this happen? Because uh, actually any channel is stochastic in nature. And uh, so it, you have transition between the closed and the open state, so you have these steps, uh, stochastic transition for all channels. And if you use neuron, actually, and you want to simulate a process, the generation of an action potential, and you use 100 channels, stochastic channels, you end up with the traces on the left, so you have different traces generated each time because it's stochastic in nature. But if you move up and you go to 10,000 channels, actually you have just a small jitter, but it's basically always the same response. And it turns out that 10,000 channels is much closer to reality than 100 channels. So this is somehow explaining that, yeah, there is stochasticity going on, but at least for the, uh, this aspect, the impact is not that big. So from this message we get, a, well, this, this is giving us a clear message. So if you have just few components, noise is of course quite more important than if you have more components. So this is an important message because if you go to the synapses, in the, when you deal with synapses, the numbers are really smaller compared to 10,000 channels. So for example, for the mossy fiber to ground cell synapse, you have just free releasing sites. So each time you have a contact between the mossy fiber and the postsynaptic site, you have three different, let's say, independent regions uh, 
in which the mossy fiber is contacting the postsynaptic site. And they behave stochastically. And uh, stochasticity actually can be introduced quite simply with the scheme I outline here. And on the right, you see the difference between the experiments and the model. So when you implement this stochasticity in the model, you actually turn out to be able to reproduce quite well what happens in the experiment. And this is quite interesting because once you have this form of stochasticity, you can uh, mimic what happens in the experiment. And since, I mean, the brain takes decision on a single trial base, uh, you should consider that it's important to, uh, to deal with this because, uh, I mean, you, you don't have time to repeat and to average a lot of responses. So this is just to say that I, I will not go to that, but in this study, so Arleo Nies et al., we investigated the information processing. So the information processing allows to investigate how the parameters of the model affect how the channel information uh, is changes. Then, final word about the role of inhibition in the mossy fiber granule cell transmission. So I should also say that in addition to the complexity of the glomerules, there are also different subtypes of GABA receptors, which is really peculiar. So you have these alpha-6 receptors that activate and decay quite slowly. And it's really, really, really peculiar for the cerebellum. Then you have also tonic GABA receptors. I mean, since the glomerulus is a almost a closed structure, you have, you have some GABA around, which contribute to uh, a basal level of uh, GABA that activate the, some receptors that are uh, sensible to very low concentration. So you get some kind of leak current in the, in the neurons. And then you have also pre-post uh, GABA receptors, GABA-B receptors, that can also regulate the neurotransmission. In particular, what we noticed is that when we performed experiments between the Golgi cell and the granule cell, uh, by modulating the activity of the pre-GABA-B uh, pre receptors, so switching off or switching on, that resulted in uh, different responses to uh, regular st stimuli. And, uh, but the difference was actually very, uh, I mean, simple to explain based on the parameter of the release probability. And actually, it turns out that if you go to the experiments and ask to the experimentalists, so my colleague, Lisa Mapelli, uh, it turns out that uh, it's really one single parameter that changes when you uh, switch off this uh, GABA-B receptor. So understanding that, it helps to, I mean, translate experimental findings to the, to the model. But in this case, just by changing one parameter. Then what we did is uh, additional tests to verify that uh, it's possible to match the model with different uh, experimental data. Uh, because, of psycho because of lack of time, I will just run to other considerations. So the, of course, I'm not mentioning here long-term potentiation. I am just mention that, mentioning that as a, an experimental protocol, but of course this can be also modeled. It's a process that can be modeled, and there are studies uh, by Migliore. You will uh, hear from him tomorrow. I'm not sure he will speak about long-term potentiation, but it's just to say that uh, interesting studies by him. And then <clears throat> at other synapses, uh, LTP induced also postsynaptic changes, so it reorganized the postsynaptic site, and we performed a computational simulation in, in order to clarify if there is a function of that. And uh, we found that clustering receptors uh, contribute to lower the noise. And then there is also another fascinating aspect of neurotransmission. And that, uh, I mean, came out quite strongly in 2008, showing that the receptors uh, are not sticked and are not fixed in the, the sinus, so they can move around. And it was, this was a science paper in 2008. And actually, uh, the Brownian motion is not just noise, Brownian. It actually turns out that it contributes to the short-term facilitation. So this is quite interesting because it means that there are properties inbuilt in the circuit that can be also helped but by components that are actually, at the end, noisy. <clears throat> 
And Brownian motion is actually something, uh, I'm, I'm coming from physics, so it's quite a, an interesting aspect to study uh, when you go down to these uh, um, biological preparations. And uh, actually we studied that in, the, in a paper that came out uh, just two years ago. And uh, in that study we managed to demonstrate another interesting fact that the receptors can diffuse and actually they can diffuse from one synapse to another one. Again, this is quite interesting because it means that you can uh, bring some information from one synapse to the other synapse. And uh, that means somehow that synapses are not independent. And uh, well, this is of course some, uh, a new challenge also for for computational modeling, because uh, in computational modeling you always assume that synapses are independent. And I think that's all for my talk, and I hope it was short enough to, to, <laughs> to bring us to the lunchtime. Hello, my name is Oren, I'm from Idan Segev Lab, and I'll uh, show you a small tutorial, small introduction on neuron. And um, this tutorial is part of a bigger tutorial. You can find it here. Uh, so I'll just show you in a, in a fly's bird about what is neuron and how to use it. So neuron simulation platform is designed for modeling individual neurons and network of neurons. It is particularly well suited for question which is which tied to biology because it, it connects between biology and modeling. As uh, Stefano said, it was developed in uh, Yale by Ted Carnival and Michael Eins, and lately the Blue Brain project got heavily involved in developing it. So today, Neuron is used as a Python package. You just do form Neuron import H or import GUI, and then you can use it. In addition to, to Neuron, there are mod files, which are a bit like extensions to Neuron, which can code very efficiently and fast different channels. So the tutorial presents a single compartment model and ball and stick model, and maybe if I have time, a replication of published result. And you can download it and also uh, do other two application of published result for a layer five pyramidal cell. Uh, in addition to coding with neuron to just writing code, it has a very powerful, not amazingly beautiful, but very powerful GUI that will not go inside. So each, each uh, slide has a title, and in the GitHub there is a, a full code for each slide. So you can just go to the GitHub, get this single compartment neuron passive, and you have the full code that shows the example. So how neuron work exactly? So imagine we have a point neuron, just a soma, and we have an electrode, right? This is what really exists in, in our experiment. Uh, imagine it's, it's a real experiment. We model it, we automatically, we translate it to this com uh, RC uh, electrical circuit, right? So let's see, this electrode that we have in the experiment is represented by this circuit. Those channels are represented by this uh, resistor, and it has a reversal potential, and the membrane is represented by a capacitance. So in Neuron, what we do, we just build this model in 3D space in our simulation, and then Neuron automatically takes care of translating it to this uh, electrical representation. So how do we do it? Just an example. We do form neuron import eight. We just import neuron as a package. We create this uh, section, this object. We create some, we can create it in a different way. And then imagine we created an object. We need to set what is the length and what is the diameter, what is the size of this object. So imagine we measured a soma in the experiment, and we said that the length of this uh, object is 10 micrometer, we set the diameter. Now we want to put those, the channels, right? So we insert the passive channels, those little channels, and set the amount of channels. Okay, but what we are missing, we're missing the electrode, right? So we also need to, in, to add the electrode. We add the eye clamp, a current clamp. A current clamp electrode can 
uh, inject current, we set the delay. So if it's a current clamp, we need to know what will be the delay, how much to inject. So this is the amplitude and the duration. And now we set up a, a virtual um, cell with an electrode. As I said before, neuron automatically translated to this electrical circuit, and for most cases, we don't need to take care of much about this uh, translation. We can also record the voltage in the soma, record the current that we ejected, and record the time. And then we can run the simulations. And then after we run the simulation, we can plot the result. So here we can show the current that we inject to the cell. And here we can see the voltage that was developed in the cell. Okay, so this is the main idea. You create a virtual experiment. You create a cell. You create an electrode in, in your mind or in the computer. And then the simulator already take care of how to translate it to electrical circuit. So this was a passive neuron. As, as we see, it doesn't spike. If we wanted to spike, what we need to do, we need to also add a voltage-dependent channel, the potassium and sodium channels. So this is exactly as before. But now we also add the potassium channel, right? We do H dot soma, insert KV. So we added the potassium channel. We set the number of potassium channel that we have. We add the sodium channel. We set the temperature. And now when we inject the current, we'll get spikes. So it's, it's relatively, once you understand the concept that you just need to create a 3D space and a model, and you can translate it to whatever electrical circuit that you need to be, it is much easier. Okay. But the real power of neuron is, is that it can support multi-compartment modeling. So until now, we talked about one compartment. We had one soma, one object. Now we create another one, which is a dendrite. And this, and we set the length of the dendrite, let's say 500 micrometer, and the diameter will be smaller. And we inject the passive resistance, the little channels. But now we have another thing. If we have RA, which is the XL resistance. Again, the XL resistance is the resistance of the cytoplasma. If you're a biologist, you know that cytoplasma has a resistance. So you set the XL resistance, and a, and then you need to connect those two sections, you do it with connect. But when we talk, to, when we talk about something that has much uh, uh, longer distance, we need to translate it to compartments. We need to disc discretize it. And the more compartment that we have, the slower it is, but the more accurate the simulation is, the more close is, is it to reality. And there is a way to, in neuron to automatically uh, divide the neuron to compartments. We can read more about it here. It's just, uh, it said the number of compartments, so it is so enough, accurate enough, but doesn't take too much of a simulation. So when we build this thing, this code build a 3D space, a 3D object, and neuron automatic translator to this multi-compartment model. You have the different compartment, each one has its own membrane resistance and capacitance, and there is also the resistance between different compartments. Okay, so now when we have a 3D space in a model, we want to ask ourselves, how do we access different location in the model? How do we know what is the voltage, what is the current, what happened in the different location in the model? In the, exper in the real experiment, what we do, we just take the electrode and put it wherever we want. But here we need to set what is the location that we in, uh, put the electrode in or where we measure. So neuron automatically normalize each object to distance of one. So imagine we have a dendrite. There is the physical, the real physical length of this dendrite, and neuron automatically translated to a normalized distance. I'll give an example. Imagine I have a dendrite which is 10 micrometer, and if I want to examine the voltage after seven micrometers, so there is some convention of where is the start and where is the end, I need to do dent 0.7 right, seven divided by 10, and dot V. And then I get the voltage, seven micrometer from the start. And the same would happen if I had a 100 micrometer dendrite. I again do dent 0.7, 100 micrometer dendrite, and I want to examine the, the voltage at 70 micrometer from the start. Again, dent 0.7, dot V. 
Sorry? It's a relative. It's, it's, ever, it's always normalized, and you just decide on location. I'll show you an example. Imagine I have a dendrite. It's the same dendrite. One time I divided to one compartment, so it will look like this. One time I divided to two compartments, so I have two compartments, and one time I have it to three, I divide to three compartments. In all cases, the length is the same. And now I, I do dent point one V. So in this case, I'll get the first compartment. In this case, I'll also get the first compartment out of two. In this case, also the first compartment out of three. But if I do then point four, I'll get here again the first compartment, here the first compartment, but here I'll get the second compartment. So it's, so it's just, it's, it's relative to the amount of compartment that you have. So this is how you access different location in the dendrite. And now let's see, uh, let's try to model this, this uh, neuron. So we created the soma, again, create, we put an electrode here which will inject current, it's an eye clamp. We set the delay, the duration, and the amplitude. We record the voltage in the soma, but now we also re we want to record the voltage in those different compartments that we have here. So here, I don't have much time, but uh, I, I create a section, and h dot dent is our section, is our dendrite, but it's also an iterator in Python. So you mean that you can iterate over it and get every different segment in the dendrite. So I just iterate over the dendrite. For each segment, I create a new vector, and then I access this vector to record the voltage. Again, I also record the time, and I start the simulation. And let's see what happens. We see we injected the current to the soma, so the voltage in the soma is the highest. And the farther we go from the soma, the lower is the voltage. We can see here that the, the, this is dent 0.95. This is sort, sort of our, our less compartment. If we also add sodium and potassium channel to the soma, okay, then we, we inject the current, we will get a spike. And we can see something very interesting that, that is uh, uh, that the voltage attenuation of the spike is much longer than the voltage attenuation of the steady state voltage injection, current injection. Okay? Okay, so that's uh, uh, just the general concept. Again, you can ask me, I'm, I'll be here, and you can, I, and each uh, slide in the tutorial also have in the comments area some exercises that you can do and can help you. Um, another thing that is, uh, that you can do with neuron, you can add synapses, or you can explore different experimental questions. For example, we know that in the neocortex, we have some inhibitory neurons that are targeting the soma of the pyramidal cell, and some different inhibitory neurons that target the apical tuft of the pyramidal cell. So first thing, this is the first model that we build. This is how it looks like. This is just a representation of what I showed before. It's clear, and it's already a model. And then you can build a real uh, uh, let's say if you want to explore why exactly some uh, neurons, some neurons uh, target the soma and some neurons target the dendrite, we can build a ball and stick model, put synapses in the distal parts or in the proximal parts, inhibitory synapses, and then start, start to see what happens to the voltage. So I will not go inside the details because it's a bit complicated and I don't have much time, but we would imagine that the proximal inhibition will reduce the amount of spike more than the distal inhibition. And what they found in the model, using the model, that actually the proximal inhibition is less effective in uh, reducing the number of spike that you get than the distal inhibition. And you can read more about it from a paper that we have in the lab. Okay, so this is what you can do with single neuron model. You have a question, you build some simplified model or a detailed model. You play with the parameter, you add synapses in different locations, you try to replicate this uh, question in a model, and then try to understand what happens. So we have a ball and stick model. We now learned how we represent it by multi-compartment model. If we have a full dendrite, we can just say that it is created by a lot of ball and stick. And if we know how to do this translation, and we know to do how to do this translation, we can also know how to do this translation, and eventually, from a full morphology, build a multi-compartmental model. Another example, for example, is layer five pyramidal cell. 
here you have an example, how do you load it? You load it to the, uh, I will not go inside the details, but I'm here if you have any question. Here I put an electrode, right? If I want to record or inject current, I need to put an electrode in the SOMA, if I want to record from the SOMA. Imagine I also want to record from the Nexus, so I put an electrode in the Nexus, it's just location, the bifurcation, location of the multi-compartmental model. And imagine I inject current to the SOMA, I will get spikes in the SOMA, and you'll see the attenuation to the dendrite. This is what I see in the dendrite. And you can see the attenuation of the spike in this cell. Uh, or, for example, we can see that if we inject some current to the nexus, we won't get any spike in the soma. If we inject current to the soma, we'll get a spike in the soma. But if we inject both the current to the soma and the same current to the nexus, we'll get a calcium burst, a calcium spike, which have three spikes. And this is a really interesting phenomenon that was, we managed to replicate it in a 3D reconstructed cell and help us to explore this phenomena. What's exactly, when does it happen? So this is a, just an overview. As I said, you can access this uh, tutorial here. You can do all the exercises that I have in the presentation and also run all the code and, and, and I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you. A um, couple of days ago, there was a paper published in Science, probably you've seen it, uh, from uh, uh, Larkum. Markum. Mark, yeah. Did, did you see it, yeah? The paper? Yeah, yeah the from paper. From Albert yeah. Gidon, it's the same one from the, ah. the same author. He switched from uh, modeling to do experiment. Yeah. But he's also doing modeling. Yeah, because they also use the same kind of approach to show the importance of um, sodium and calcium channels in the dendrites, yeah? They did with human neurons, yeah? So in principle, the same kind of approach, I mean, this is just to be explained to those who are not using these kind of models, no? Can be used very flexibly to approach different kind of problems. Exactly. I think that, like Stefan said, it gives you some kind of understanding of the biology, which is, it gives you some kind of boundaries of what's possible in biology when you use those models, and you can change them, but as much as they are flexible, there are some things that you cannot do. And then it gives you, well, it cannot do biologically or, or realistically, and then it gives you some boundaries, and then you know what to explore. Exactly. Other questions? Okay. So now we have Charles from uh, Nest Community, Eurik, and then uh, later we have uh, Ben on Arbor Environment. Thanks a lot. Very good. Okay, that should be better. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce to you today the uh, Nest Simulator. Um, we've already heard some words about. Um, Can you <laughs> To move in this space. I understand. Thanks. Um, yeah, we've already heard the term uh, multi scale simulation come up earlier today. So I thought it would be good to, um, to first start off by placing Nest among the scales of simulation. Um, and here you can see a schematic overview of um, different levels of detail of simulation where on the extreme right you have uh, the greatest amount of detail where you might have the simulation of uh, stochastic ion channels, as we have heard in the previous talk, um, very detailed uh, reaction diffusion models. And then as we come to the left, uh, we kind of go down in complexity. Um, so uh, we begin to abstract um, lengths of dendrite into single compartments. And then continuing to the left, we might even um, summarize the behavior of an entire neuron, uh, complex branching dendrite and everything, into a single point. Um, and this is roughly where the Nest simulator has its strength. So in Nest, uh, 
uh, unlike in neuron, you do not tend to have this uh, complexity of um, very many compartments, hundreds, thousands of compartments. Um, you would tend to reduce your neuron model into um, usually one compartment. This is known as a point neuron. Uh, or maybe several compartments, uh, including, for example, active dendrites. Um, what this allows you to do, so you, you give up some of the detail that you see in nature, but this allows you to uh, scale up your simulations. So if you have this uh, vast amount of detail uh, on, on the right side of this picture, then you might be able to simulate uh, a few thousand cells at most, and um, your simulations might take some days or weeks. But if you take away some of the complexity, then um, this will allow you to run very large uh, simulations, so simulations of networks uh, containing uh, millions of nodes. Um, an example here uh, is given on the, the bottom right. What you see there is a photo of the K computer in Japan. Um, I think it's now being decommissioned, it's being upgraded, but this was the um, uh, the 18th most powerful computer in the world a few years ago. And uh, it was used as a platform to, uh, to simulate, using the NES simulator, the, the largest network uh, containing 1.73 billion neurons. Now, just a funny little thing. So it says they're 40 minutes per second. So uh, can we simulate 40 minutes of neural network time in one second of wall clock time? Unfortunately, not yet. It takes us 40 minutes of waiting to simulate one second of neural network time. But we do have uh, you know, 10 trillion synapses. So we think it's already a very good uh, performance of the simulator. Um, I will go through a few highlights of um, how Nest is built, what are its uh, design goals. Then I will take you through a bit of uh, use cases, how you would use it in practice and um, conclude with some words on the Nest community. So as I said, uh, the main strength of Nest is uh, point neurons, so where you have one compartment or a few compartments. And um, there is a vast model library included with the Nest simulator. I will go into a bit of detail, uh, take you through a bit of a tour of that in a few slides. Um, I'd also like to point out, especially in this community, that we have uh, good support for interaction with other simulators. So if, uh, especially in the case of cerebellum, one is often interested in motor control. Um, as you may know, the uh, Human Brain Project has a, a virtual robotics platform. And um, so where you can, you can simulate robots, can simulate um, movement uh, of, of animals. And uh, one of the primary use cases that we're working on right now is connecting the Nest Simulator to this robotics platform. This is already in place, um, but we're, we're continuing to build on this. Uh, so this is an especially interesting use case um, in this context. Um, the Nest Simulator scales really well. Uh, this, this is one of its primary goals. So you can have the same simulation script run on your laptop as on this big supercomputer. If you do it like that, then probably you will not be able to squeeze out all the performance that you can. There are some, some tweaks that you can continue to, continue to do. But basically, um, the, it, it scales almost without limit. If you have a supercomputer that's twice as big, you can run networks that are twice as large. Um, the primary design goal of Nest is that we're driven by scientific use cases. So um, I'd like to invite everyone that if you have a specific use case that you're working on and you think that the Nest Simulator would be a good platform uh, to use for this, um, please come to us. Please tell us about this. We are very interested in this interaction. Um, we support this with uh, a number of features of the Nest Simulator. Um, so I don't have time to go into all, uh, all the details, but um, the, um, the, there are uh, several neuron models that are unique in that we can um, simulate them very precisely. So usually when you run a simulation, you, uh, you run into certain uh, discretization artifacts. You don't have a continuous time scale, but you take steps uh, in, uh, in discrete time steps. 
And um, usually this will lead to some artifacts, to some rounding errors, to some loss of accuracy. But in uh, many of the models that are included in Nest, you will not suffer from this at all. So you will uh, be able to simulate your models with kind of perfect accuracy uh, as allowed by uh, floating point computation. Um, so when you come to us with a use case, then we, uh, we have dedicated teams to support you in that, to uh, bring together this technical aspect of making things run on the big supercomputer and the particular scientific use case that you're working on. And um, then we, so we, we try to streamline that process and uh, we have a workflow in place that includes uh, peer review of contributed code, uh, continuous integration, and uh, a whole battery of uh, automated testing to make sure that results that come out of the Nest simulator are what you expect. That the simulator itself is not introducing additional artifacts into your simulation, because often once you, um, you build a model, you're already making some abstractions and uh, ignoring some irrelevant details, uh, but then you don't want the simulator itself to also um, add additional inaccuracies on top of that. Um, there's one uh, technical detail that I thought would be interesting to highlight here. Um, this is at the core of how Nest performs simulations. So as I mentioned, uh, what you tend to do when you simulate a dynamical system on a computer is you tend to take discrete time steps here indicated by the letter H. Um, so typically this would be you know, a time step of one millisecond or 0.1 millisecond. And the smaller you make this time step, the more accurate your simulations are gonna be, but the longer they will take to simulate. Um, Nest um, relies on a minimum dendritic delay in the network. So when you have a connection between a presynaptic and a postsynaptic neuron, there's often a delay involved in um, a spike reaching the target. Uh, this delay um, is here uh, indicated with the letter D. So let's say you have a distribution of delays in your network, but there's one minimum delay, let's say one millisecond, and this delay is usually longer than the simulation time step that you're using. So if your time step H here is 0.1 millisecond and your minimum delay is one millisecond, um, then what Nest enables you to do is um, enhance the, uh, the performance of the simulation by um, uh, simulating neurons independently for this minimum delay period because we know that it's gonna take this delay period for the spike to arrive, so we kind of have this margin for doing processing until we, can, uh, we get to processing that spike. So in practice, this means for you that uh, your connections in the network that you simulate will tend to have a certain delay associated with it. Um, now, as I said, Nest scales very well. So um, what you see here, so there are, are two kinds of scaling. There's so-called strong scaling and weak scaling. Uh, the one involves um, scaling your problem set. So instead of simulating a network with 10,000 neurons, you might simulate a network of 100,000 neurons. And the other type of scaling involves using a bigger computer. So you would have your same network of 10,000 neurons, but now you simulate it on a supercomputer instead of on your laptop. Um, in both of these scenarios, Nest scales extremely well, in both in terms of runtime performance and memory consumption. And this is a demonstration that was carried out uh, some years ago, um, where a network was simulated on both our uh, local supercomputer in Jülich, um, it's called Uqueen, and the K computer in Japan. So Uqueen here is indicated by the, uh, the blue line and the blue dots, and you can see the K computer is slightly bigger, so we can run more threads. So the number of threads here is on the uh, horizontal axis. And um, basically, what you see here is that if you, um, you increase the size of your computer, so enabling you to run more threads, so you can have either you know, more cores in your CPU or more uh, computers in your supercomputer network, then this allows you to simulate larger and larger networks. And the scaling is um, the, uh, the top two dashed lines, 
uh, which kind of continue to grow. So, so normally uh, what you might see is that at some point it begins to level off, uh, where you get saturation of communication buffers, MPI buffers, that sort of thing. But Nest just kind of um, continues to grow. So um, this is kind of uh, a reassuring feeling that you can begin to write your script on your laptop, knowing that you can always um, have this headroom to grow as you, as you want. Now, I will say a few words about um, how you might use Nest in practice. Um, Python is, of course, the go-to interface these days for neuroscience. Um, Nest comes with its own Python interface. So there's a few lines here on top demonstrating what that might look like, uh, where um, a population of 8,000 integrated fire neurons is created. And um, I will go a little bit more into the, the details of what is, what is done here. So a spike detector is created, some connections are created, and then we uh, run the simulation. Um, but Pine is another very popular Python front end for, for multi-simulator interfaces. So the idea with Pine is that you can use your same script and run your simulation on Nest or, uh, or other simulators um, without changing the script itself. Um, so basically, we're well connected uh, with these standard interfaces. Now, um, the way that you would set up a simulation in Nest is rather similar to what we saw in Neuron. So we have a certain experimental situation in biophysics that we try to recreate um, in silico. In this simple scenario, there's a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron that we will then um, create nodes for in a network graph. So we first create the nodes, presynaptic neuron, postsynaptic neuron, and then connect them together, uh, forming the edges of the graph. Um, I will take you through a quick uh, flyby of the, um, the models that are included um, in Nest. So when you download Nest, it actually comes with uh, the models library already, uh, already bundled with it. And this includes um, over 50 neuron models from standard models like integrated and fire neurons that can be solved uh, precisely to um, nonlinear models, uh, Hodgkin-Huxley models. Um, we recently had an addition of uh, generalized leaky integrated and fire family from the Ellen Institute, uh, contributed by them. And um, we also have some neuron models with more than one compartment. So this is a scenario where you might have an active dendrite that you want to simulate. Then instead of having this whole uh, complexity of a branching dendrite, you might say, I will reduce this complexity to a, a neuron with just two compartments, one for the soma and one for the dendrite. And then, of course, um, you can simulate much larger networks. Similarly, for synapse models, um, we have many plastic synapses, uh, several flavors of spike timing dependent plasticity, uh, triplet SDP, the clopath synapse, um, neuro uh, modulated, so dopamine modulated SDP and also gap junctions. Um, as for stimulation devices, this is kind of what you would expect, some Poisson generators, uh, generators of spikes according to uh, gamma distributions. And this is also rather extensible. So if you want to create your own device that has uh, a distribution that is not yet in the, uh, the models included with Nest, then it's very easy to, uh, to implement this. Recording devices is about the same, so we can record spikes, uh, continuous values. We have some specialized devices like the correlation detector. Um, one thing to note is that a lot of these operations, like figuring out correlations between neurons, you could easily do in post-processing. So you would run the simulation, extract the data, and then do this correlation analysis. But it is typically much more efficient to do this at runtime. Um, where this uh, analysis can be done um, in, um, on, a, on a level that is much closer to the CPU, so in a, in a more efficient manner. Um, and then also there's the weight recorder, which allows you to record the uh, dynamics of the weights in case of plastic synapses. Um, once you have these nodes, so you have your stimulation devices, your neurons, synapses, 
then you want to connect everything together with a certain uh, structure to it. Um, so again, this is kind of uh, what you would expect. That there are um, several uh, connectivity patterns that you can choose from. And um, this is also uh, constantly being extended. Um, this is uh, something that is coming very soon with the release of Nest 3, the latest version of the simulator, where these distributions um, can be specified in a very user-friendly manner. So again, you can um, easily create individual synapses from your Python script, so you say connect this neuron with this neuron, with this delay, this weight, and so on, and then do that for all pre-post pairs. Um, and that technically works, but it's not, it, it doesn't scale. So if you have a network with uh, 10,000 neurons or 100,000 neurons, then making all of these connections individually um, will mean that the setup time for your network is measured in days. And this is not practical, so you need the interface to, uh, to have this done kind of close to the metal, so at a level where it's efficiently done. Um, and Nest has the features for this. Uh, we also allow um, neurons and nodes in the network to have a specific location in three-dimensional space uh, using the, uh, the topology module. Um, so I'm, I'm just going through a fly-through because of uh, uh, time constraints, but just to give you a, a taste of the features that you can expect in the NES simulator. Um, gap junctions have been recently, recently implemented. So gap junctions are a little bit of a... Um, a class apart because we have this minimum synaptic delay in the network. Of course, gap junctions operate without any delay. So a special framework was instituted to uh, allow gap junctions to be simulated without any hit in performance. Um, then to come to a full example, so um, basically what you do here is you import the Nest module you create the nodes in your network, neuron voltmeter, spike generator, and um, then you connect them together using the nest.connect. Uh, you can specify uh, parameters like the weight. Uh, potentially, you would use um, distributions here. Then you would run the simulation and extract the uh, recorded values using this get status interface. Um, this is just a very simple example. So we have a a spike generator that spikes at times uh, 10 and 50 milliseconds. So the result will look something like this. We have an excursion of the postsynaptic memory potential. But um, simulating larger, more complex networks will um, not significantly extend the length of your script. So again, the, the scaling is, is very good there. Um, as one of the, the final feature highlights, I just want to plug uh, my own project. So I'm working on uh, a domain-specific language called NestML. And um, this is a little bit akin to uh, the hoc or hoc files in Neuron, which is when you want to add your own mechanism. So let's say you have your own um, or custom set of ionic channels that you want to endow your neurons with. Then if you want to add these as a feature to your simulator, so you can, you can say, uh, create a population of my custom neuron, then you know, how do you express this custom neuron? This, this is typically not done within the Pine or PyNest simulation script. This is done in a language like Hoke. In Nest, we have uh, NestML. So this allows you to express single neuron models, which are then later on instantiated in your simulation script. So instead of writing uh, hundreds of tedious lines of C++ code, you can express it in this accessible language um, where you can express in a very direct manner uh, differential equations, like here for the memory potential, you see a V underscore ABS uh, with a quotation mark. Quotation mark indicates the temporal derivative. And uh, you can also express uh, postsynaptic responses in a very um, natural manner. So in this case, we have a postsynaptic response that is called G. In this case, that's just a decaying exponential. So that means that if you have a spike incoming to your neuron, then um, this will uh, cause um, postsynaptic current to be injected. And this postsynaptic current has the shape of a decaying exponential. 
Um, so, um, once you have your simulation script written, you're tweaking it a little, and probably at some point you'll want to read up a bit on the documentation of how to um, do that one thing. Um, we recently migrated our documentation to read the docs, so everything is now in a unified format. It's, it's very accessible. And um, most of all, I want to emphasize that we're very reachable. So we have a, a mailing list where we provide support. Uh, we have every two weeks an open video conference where everybody is welcome to join and present the use cases that they're interested in simulating. And um, all of the Nest Simulator development is public. It all happens on our GitHub page. So you can see exactly uh, what are some of the outstanding issues that we're working on and um, what's in the pipeline for Nest, ML, uh, for, for Nest and NestML. Um, so I, I cannot implore you enough. Um, if, you, if you have a particular use case or you run into an issue uh, with your simulation, please tell us about it. Just send an email on the mailing list and uh, we'll be happy to help. Um, as a final word, I would like to uh, also advertise the Nest conference. Uh, every year we have a meeting of uh, users and developers. Um, this year it will take place in summer in, um, in Norway, close to Oslo. Um, so you are warmly invited to submit your abstract, uh, submit a poster presentation, and uh, come discuss your work with the Nest developers. That's all. Thank you very much. Any questions, potentially? So to address your first question, um, the Nest Simulator is currently targeting uh, primarily uh, CPUs, so not GPUs. Uh, we're working on a backend for GPUs, but um, the, the scaling um, as of now is more open-ended for CPUs. Um, within the HPP, there are many opportunities to apply for compute time. Um, so if you um, are kind of reaching the limits of your laptop, you want to scale up, then um, I think there's um, a low threshold process that you can go to to uh, request compute time on one of the supercomputers that are uh, within the HPP project. Um, I'm not quite sure I understood your second question entirely. So you, the compiler... That's better. Okay, so um, I'm here to talk about Arbor, and um, unlike some of the other tools like uh, Nest and Neuron that have been uh, presented so far today, I'm pretty sure that this will be new to everybody. So 15, 20 minutes isn't really long enough to, uh, to, to do an introduction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a, a I decided to constrain the talk to looking at a specific part of Arbor, which is the new interface that we've developed for developing single cell models. So Arbor has been developed entirely within the Human Brain Project, and it's a collaboration between the Swiss National Supercomputing Center, CSCS, and, uh, and ULIC, so two HPC centers. And it's a C++ library with a Python wrapper for the simulation of networks of multi-compartment models. And if you wanted to, we saw the nice um, slide in the last talk that showed the kind of the different scales that you can model um, networks and cells at. And the nearest existing simulator is Neuron in terms of the, uh, the complexity in the cells. So we model dendritic trees and axons in, uh, in great detail. So, the original motivation behind developing Arbor was that we were concerned that we installed a large GPU-based system in CSCS about five years ago, and we were concerned that we wanted the HPP's main 
HBP's main H, uh, simulation workloads to run on that architecture and on future architectures. And as you know, the HPP has set some very ambitious goals for simulation. And to meet those, you're going to have to be able to utilize all of the HPC, the latest and greatest HPC resources that are available. And so, I mean, the long story short is that, you know, any future gains, if you're going to want, keep using the new HP architectures and keep things getting faster and faster, like they have for, say, the last 15 years with CPUs, you're going to have to use software that can utilize GPUs. And we just have a look at, for example, at the list of the different HPC systems, the biggest ones in Europe and the biggest ones in the world that are either installed right now or are going to be installed over the next two to three years. There's a list there, but they are, they've all got one thing in common, and that is that they use GPUs. So in the very near future, if you want to apply for time at a HPC center to run large simulations, it's going to have to be with GPUs. So I don't know how many people are familiar with the, uh, the old proverb about uh, putting a frog in a pot of hot water and then warming the water up, but he might not notice too late. He might notice too late that he's in a boiling pot of water, but that's happening to some HPC uh, user communities, and that was the motivation behind Arbor. So I could give lots of slides about how we get wonderful performance and how we do all of that, but instead I wanted to stick with the theme that I noticed the other talks we've had earlier today were about, which was uh, developing single cell models. And I think this is a really important topic because building and then optimizing or tuning single cell models and then maintaining them is really it's the first step that people do when they're building multi-compartment network models. This is the first thing that has to be done. And inside those models, you have um, you know, decades worth of institutional knowledge. So you know, Egidio was telling me that he started using Neuron in the late 90s, he's the first person to publish a paper in Neuron in Europe. And so there's 20 years worth of institutional knowledge locked up in these things, and each, each lab or each research group does their experimentation, develops their models, and then each, they have a, each one has a different focus, different ideas, different concepts, different models, and all of these are encoded in different ways into their single cell models. And as a result, if any bit of simulation software is going to support all those users and their workflows, it's got to have not just good performance, good HPC performance, but it's got to have very good, um, a very rich interface that allows people to express all the different, uh, different model aspects that they want to express. And this is something that we realized quite early on with Arbor, that implementing the high performance part was a challenge, but it wasn't actually the biggest challenge. Well over 50%, I'd say more like 70% of our effort is spent on the part of the code that provides an interface to the user to be able to express arbitrary and complex models, and the part that then turns those rich descriptions into lowered code, which is optimized for a specific hardware backend, like a GPU or a multi-core CPU, so that it can actually be executed in parallel. So, and this is the reason that Neuron is really the only simulation package at this particular scale, because it does strike a balance between, allow, it allows users to enter in arbitrarily complicated models. Users might complain that it's a bit difficult to use and a bit ugly, but it lets people do that, and I think that's one of its, uh, its key, key features. Now, I, I keep on going on, so I'll, I'll look, now I'm gonna look at you know, some of the different steps that people go through when building single cell models. Like, so we've looked at a lot of people's, you know, workflows and kind of analyzed or had to try to figure out, you know, what their approaches are. And these are the, um, the steps that, uh, one way of breaking down the steps that one will go through using Neuron. So people have mentioned earlier that Neuron provides this Neuron programming language called HOC. And it also provides a language called nmodel, which are these nmod files. And using these two kind of languages, we can build, build a single cell model. So the first step we can have is def defining mechanism dynamics, which is really your ion channels and your synapses, which is done using nmodel. Then 
the, following, the rest of the steps are done using Hock. The first is to define the morphology geometry. That might be as simple as loading it from a file or actually using the Hock language to construct the morphology. Then there's some sort of process of then taking that morphology and breaking it up into regions of interest. It might be as simple as soma and dendrite. It might be breaking the dendrite up into subregions that we want to, to, uh, to do different things on. Then there's the process of then attaching mechanisms, so attaching our ion channels or our synapses to these different regions and locations that we've marked on the cell. And then defining the inputs to the cell and the outputs. So inputs are things like stimuli and spike sources coming from elsewhere, and outputs might be our state variables or voltages, currents that we want to read, as well as um, spikes. And in, so, what people might say, well, what about the Python interface that is provided by Neuron? Well, the Python interface is just a thin wrapper around HOC. So wherever you see HOC, you can think Python, Python here. So we, we had came to the realization that if we were going to support the same workflows as Neuron, we have to support both HOC and NModel or provide a very good replacement for them. So the first thing to look at is uh, NModel, which is this uh, language for describing ion channels and uh, synapse dynamics. And there are some challenges to implementing NModel. There's no one has ever written down an actual specification of exactly what NModel is. But NModel does have one strength, which is its, um, its domain is very well constrained. It has one job, and that job is to describe ion channel dynamics and uh, synapse dynamics, as long as we ignore something called uh, verbatim blocks. But, if you, but it's, it's got a very well-constrained uh, domain. So for that, for that reason, we've implemented what we consider to be a, a sensible subset of NModel. That is, we haven't implemented everything, because it's not really possible to implement everything in NModel, but we've implemented the parts that are used most, most widely by users. And what we do, we take in the end model code and then we generate highly optimized uh, targets, code that targets different hardware backends that we support. So currently it works on NVIDIA GPUs. We've got support for AMD GPUs coming very soon. And we also have support for uh, SIMD vectorization, which is an optimization technique for different types of uh, CPUs. So, the other half of the equation is HOC, which is basically a scripting language. Now, if Python had been around back in the day when Neuron was first being developed, I'm sure that the developer of Neuron would have used Python as the scripting language straight away to build, up, to, to build on. So HOC plays a similar, it has a similar level of, um, fe of features and uh, functionality. So it's a Turing complete language which means that you can write pretty much any, you can write any computer program you want in there. People do some really, really interesting things with HOC. It doesn't, now the, it doesn't decouple the components, so the parts of your morph morphology, so your branches, your, or what, you, what they call our samples, sections, and segments, isn't really decoupled from the model description. So it becomes very, uh, the different stages that you would go through in defining a, a model become very, uh, become quite muddled up. And Hock is also present in all layers of neurons. So you see down in, in model code calls, which is the very, very lowest level, calls being made to Hock. And you see at the very highest level, calls being made to Hock. So there's no separation of, you know, where Hock is is to be used in, uh, in neurons. So basically what you have to do, if you were to implement HOC, you would have to implement neuron over again. We already have neuron. So the result of you know, these, these features of HOC are that the HOC files that people use to describe cells are, um, tend, they, they describe how to build the cell as opposed to what the cell is. So they end up with a lot of for loops, a lot of if-else blocks, describing 
you know, iterating over things called segments and trying to build up a description of the cell instead of actually describing what the, di what the, uh, what the user actually wants. And we've seen hoc files for describing more interesting cells being in, on the order of uh, hundreds or even thousands of lines of uh, Python or hoc code. So this means that someone like me who wants to come along and understand what is the model has to read through all of this code and has to kind of reverse engineer what the intention of the actual, the original person doing the modeling was. This is prone to bugs, so we've, we've found bugs in, in many of, or nearly all of, the, um, all of these hoc files and Python files we've seen. And a key thing is that these models are not portable to other simulators. They're very specific to Neuron, and there's no way to kind of take a hoc file and automatically translate it into, say, another format like NeuroML or something that another simulator could take in. A human's actually got to spend days, weeks, months going through the file and reverse engineering what the intention was. So we decided to replace HOC, if you haven't guessed that already, and we started out with some basic uh, design goals. The first was that whatever we did, it should be descriptive. It should describe the model without going into all of the low-level details. Some sort of back end should look after the actual walking through, walking over a cell tree and describing things. We should limit the scope to just describing the parts of the model we're interested in. But it should be rich enough that if someone's got a model that's currently in Neuron or in SML or another you know, widely used uh, format for describing models, you should be able to express it in Arbor using our approach. And the final test is, can we take the way that we've expressed the model in Arbor and easily automatically generate input for another simulation engine? Like, for example, could we generate HOC code from our inputs? And we're confident that we could. So um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into a full specification or all the details about how we do it. Instead, I'm just going to illustrate things with some examples of some code. So I hope people can, people can, see, can see this uh, up there. Um, so this is Python code. So this is our Python wrapper, which is a wrapper around our C++ API. Our C++ API is very um, rich and very powerful, so that if somebody was going to develop a GUI or develop an application or a workflow that used Arbor and they wanted to get the best performance, they could use the C++ API. It looks almost identical to the, to the Python one. So the first thing we can do is we've got the uh, most interesting part here is where we define a set of labels, what we call a label dictionary, which basically is a way of defining in a generic way different regions in the cell or different sets of locations on a cell. So we've defined a region called the soma, which has a tag of one, and the dendrite, which has a tag of three. And people who are familiar with an SWC file will know that SWC files, um, each sample has got a tag. And we, we, in our internal way of representing the samples or the tree, we also attach tags. So that's a simple way just to, first of all, identify those parts of the tree. So nothing's been, we've not automatically labeled things as soma or dendrite. We give people the flexibility to label them as such. And then we've got, oops, I've, uh, can I go back one moment? I accidentally clicked there. Now, we've, now what we want to do is we want to break the dendrites, the dendrite into two different regions. One region with the, which has got the radius of the, of the, uh, the cables of the sections is greater than three microns, and another where the radius is less than three microns. And we have this uh, little DSL that allows us to do this. So we take the, um, the intersection, so the, the intersection of the region called DEND, which we defined up here, and then all the regions that have got a radius less than three. And we've done the same for radius greater than three here. We've defined the tips. So now we said, well, we're actually interested in doing something at the end of all the dendritic branches, like right out at the very um, distal end of the, of the tree. The, term, the terminal points. So we ask for the intersection of the dendrite with these 
what we call terminal. So this terminal just means all the end all the endpoints on a on a tree, be it dendritic or axons or whatever. Now we load some samples from a file, granule.swc. So we have support for SWC files. We also have support for manually building the tree, and we've also got some helper little helper helper routines and types that you can use to build different types of trees. Here we're just going to load our samples from an SWC file, and then we combine this label dictionary with the samples. So you can see that this here is just a dictionary. It doesn't actually have any meaning. It's just a description, abstract description of the regions. Now we go and we apply that to an actual concrete morphology, and then Arbor in the background will go and actually calculate what these different regions are on that tree. So you can define a dictionary and then apply it to multiple morphologies, and it will just automatically adjust itself to each morphology. And then we can go and do what we call painting. Painting is where you paint properties onto the, uh, onto the membrane. So we've put some uh, HH, so Hodgson Huxley dynamics, on the everything that's called the soma. On one part of the dendrite, we just put the passive mechanics with the default parameters. On the other part, we want to change one of the parameters. So we've got an interface like that. And we can also place things like a stimulus and a, a spike detector. So now we've got the start. This is basically to find a little, a little cell. It's got some dynamics to find everywhere. It's got a stimulus and it's got a spike detector. And just as an example, we're also going to go and place some, some uh, synapse, some synapses on the, uh, on the tips, on, on the end of the dendrites. So that's, that's the cell model. And then we could go and take the cell model and we could plug it into a large network model. But if we want to just simulate a single cell and experiment with a single cell and maybe try to optimize it, we can use what we call this. We can then wrap the single cell model up, say what we want to record. We want to record voltages and currents. Where do we want to record the voltage? We want to record it at the root, which basically means at the soma in this model. And we're going to attach, or we want to measure the current at the same location that we attach the stimulus. Then we can run the simulation and have a look at the, uh, and then once we finish running the simulation, we can view the outputs. So I've rushed through all of this because I really didn't want to go too far over time. Um, as a quick conclusion, so all the features I've shown you today in Python, or discussed in Python, they are very close to completion, and they're going to be merged into the master branch for the HPP Summit, which is in a few weeks' time in Greece. Um, they will be in an official release with full documentation available online for the start of SGA3, so the next phase of the Human Brain Project, which is April this year. And then for the first six months of SGA3, we're going to be doing a lot of uh, user testing and adding support for Sonata, which is a portable exchange format for model descriptions. And we're going to have that, we're going to release version 1.0 of Arbor with these things in them on the eBrains platform after six months of SGA3. So if you want to be involved in that user testing, if this sounds like something that um, targets the sort of uh, problems you're trying to solve, then, uh, then will be the time to, to have a look. Arbor is like Nest. It's open source software, so not only is it available online, but all of our experimental branches, all of our development is available on uh, GitHub uh, forks and branches. There's no secret repositories. And all of our um, issues are also available online. And you can just ask to join our Slack channel. We're very open and friendly people. So um, I kept that to about 20 minutes. So. <laughs> Um, do we have any questions? Oh, I also wanted to say that I'm going to be here for the three days. I know this is a very brief introduction, but please just um, grab me in the hallway at lunch at any time. I'd love to talk to you. Yes. Okay, so the question was, what was the difference between the first step where we built the cable cell and then where we built the simulation. Well, the first step was really just describing the cell. Um, Arbor, then we, so that's, that's a kind of a high level description of the cell. 
So it talks about branches, sample points, things like this. When you actually want to run the model efficiently on some hardware, say a GPU or a multi-core CPU, you're going to basically take that description and turn it into a very low-level data structure that is optimized for that particular target. So what we did when we created the model was we took that high-level description and made it into something very efficient. So we didn't actually say what hardware we wanted to run it on because it's one cell, so we're just going to be running it on one core, the default, which is one core. But if you had a large model, you would say which GPUs you wanted to use, which MPI, things like this. Oh. <laughs> a few. <laughs> Do you have any benchmarks available versus Neuron already? Yes, we wrote a paper that I presented here about 12 months ago where we have our benchmark results versus Neuron, and I'd be happy to show them to you. All right. They're, uh, they're pretty good. Okay. And a final one. Um, when you load the SWCs, how would you deal with the multiple morphologies? Uh, the example was for a single cell, but... Um, you would load the multiple files into separate sample trees, I suppose, and create separate cells. And when you're building a model that's got multiple cells in it, there's a particular workflow. I didn't go into that. This is very much a single cell workflow. Mm -hmm. OK, but you could probably uh, select different morphologies with some kind of random distribution for the same uh, Yes. Cell. Okay. Yeah. Time for the tutorial. <laughs>so after having an overview of the main uh, themes of the hackathon and also of the programming languages um, we start with the second part of today with the hands-on tutorials and in order to do so we have to reorganize a bit the room and uh, to prepare the table the tables are not well oriented I see because somebody would not see the screen now we have to change the orientation of the tables and then we start right we need volunteers <laughs>